Section 50 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 50. Italy and the West, 410 to 476 by Ernest Barker. Chapter 14, Part 4 For some months after the disappearance of Avitus, there was an interregnum. Rissima apparently took no steps to fill the vacancy, and Marcion, the Eastern Emperor, was on his deathbed. At last Leo, who had eventually succeeded to Marcion by the grace of Aspar, the master of the troops in the East, elevated Rissima to the dignity of Patricius, 457, and named Majorian, who had fought by Rissima's side in the struggle of 456, as Magister Militum in his stead. A few months afterwards, the election of the Senate and the consent of the army united to make Majorian emperor. Majorian belonged to an old Roman family with administrative traditions. His grandfather had been Magister Peditum et Equitum on the Danube under Theodosius the Great. His father had been a fiscal officer under Aetius, and under Aetius he had himself served with distinction. If we can trust the evidence of his constitutions and the testimony of Procopius, Majorian has every title to be considered one of the greatest of the later Roman emperors. Not only is the rescript in which he notifies his accession to the Senate full of pledges of good government, he sought in the course of his reign to redeem his pledges and by strengthening, for instance, the office of Defensor Civitatis to repeople and reinvigorate the declining municipia of the empire. The constitution by which he sought to protect the ancient monuments of Rome is in marked contrast with the vandalism to which Avitus had been forced and bears witness to the conservative and Roman policy which he sought to pursue. In his foreign policy he addressed himself manfully to the problems which faced him in Africa, in Gaul and in Spain. His first problem lay naturally in Gaul. The party which had stood for Avitus and the Visigoths who had been its allies were both inevitably opposed to the man who had joined in Avitus's deposition and the reconciliation of Gaul to the new regime was thus of primary importance. After issuing a number of constitutions for the reform of the empire in the course of 458, Majorian crossed the Alps at the end of the year with a motley army of Rusians, Suaves and Ostrogoths. The Gallo-Roman party received him without a struggle, and the literator of the party, Sidonius Apollinaris, pronounced a eulogy on the emperor at Lyon. With the Visigoths, who had been attacking Arles, there was a short but apparently decisive struggle. Theodoric II was beaten and renewed his alliance with Rome. It remained for the Majorian to regulate the affairs of Spain and using it as a base to equip a fleet in its ports for a final attack on Gaiseric. In 460 he moved into the province. His victory over the Visigoths, themselves in occupation of much of Spain since 457, had made his path easy and a fleet of 300 vessels which had long been under preparation, was assembled at the port of Alicante for the expedition against the Vandals. But Gaiseric, aided by treachery, surprised the fleet and captured a number of ships. The projected expedition collapsed, like every expedition against Gaiseric, and Majorian had to acknowledge defeat. He seems to have made a treaty with Gaiseric, recognising the new acquisitions which Gaiseric had made since 455. But the failure of the expedition proved nevertheless his ruin. Rissima was jealous of an emperor 
who showed himself too vigorous, and though Majorian had sought to conciliate him, as the language of his constitution shows, he had failed to appease his jealousy. When he moved into Italy in the summer of 461, perhaps to forestall an attack by Rissima, he only came to meet with defeat and death in a battle near Tortona. With him, indeed, died the Roman name, and in his fall the barbarian party triumphed. His reign had been filled by a manly attempt at the Renovatio Imperii, both by administrative reforms within and a vigorous policy without, but his reforms had aroused the opposition of a corrupt bureaucracy. His foreign policy had been defeated by the cunning of Gaiseric, and he fell before the jealousy of the barbarian whom he overshadowed. The death of Majorian advanced the dissolution of the Western Empire a step further. The Visigoths and the Vandals both regarded themselves as absolved from the treaties which they had made with Majorian, and Gaiseric, hating Rissima as the nephew of Wallia, the destroyer of part of his people, directed his piratical attacks once more against Sicily and Italy. Not only so, but when Rissima raised to the imperial throne Severus, a puppet emperor on the reverse of which coins he significantly placed his own monogram, two of the provincial governors of the empire refused him allegiance and ruled as independent sovereigns within their spheres. Agadius in central Gaul, and Marcellinus in Dalmatia. Rissima was almost powerless. He could only attempt an alliance with the Visigoths against Agadius, and send his petitions to the eastern emperor Leo to keep Marcellinus and the Vandals in check. The policy had some success. Agadius and Theodoric checked each other until the death of the former in 464 and Marcellinus was induced by the Eastern Emperor to keep the peace. But Gaiseric, though he consented to restore Eudoxia and one of her daughters to Leo, refused to cease from his raids upon Italy until he had received the inheritances of Asius and Valentinian III, which he claimed in the name of his captives, Gaudentius the son of Asius, and Eudoxia the elder daughter of Valentinian, now married to his son, Honoric. To these claims he soon added another. Placidia, the younger daughter of Valentinian, was married at Constantinople to a Roman senator, Olibrius, and Gaiseric demanded that Olibrius, now the brother-in-law of his own son, and therefore likely to be a friend of the Vandals, should be acknowledged as emperor of the West. As Attila had demanded the church plate of Sirmium, and the hand of Honoria. So Gaiseric now demanded the two inheritances and the succession of Olibrius, and it was to give weight to these demands that he continued to direct his annual raids against Italy. It is perhaps the positions held by Agadius and Marcellinus in Gaul and Dalmatia which show most clearly the ruin of the empire. The flagging brain ceases to control the limbs and members of the state. The Roman scheme of an organised world community falls into fragments. Marcellinus, one of the young men trained by Aetius, had been promoted to the office of Magister Militia in Dalmatia. On the murder of Aetius, he had refused obedience to Valentinian III, but on the succession of Majorian, who was also one of Aetius's men, he resumed his allegiance to the empire and was given the task of defending Sicily. The fall of Majorian drove him once more into rebellion, and though he was forced to leave Sicily, owing to the intrigues of Rissima among his troops, he maintained himself as the independent ruler of Dalmatia. In the great expedition of 468, he joined with the eastern and western emperors as a practically independent sovereign and though he was assassinated in the course of the expedition, possibly at the instigation of Rissima, he seems to have left his nephew, Nepos, the future emperor, to succeed to his position. 
a pagan and a friend of philosophers, with whom he held high converse in his Dalmatian palace. Marcellinus stands, alike in his character and in his political position, as one of the most interesting figures of his age. His contemporary, Agadeus, is a man of more ordinary type. A lieutenant of Majorian, he had been created Magister Militum per Gallius, and on the death of his master he had assumed an independent position in central Gaul, with the aid of the Salian Franks, who in revolt against their own king had, if Gregory of Tours may be trusted, accepted him for their chief. In 1463 he had defeated the Visigoths in a battle near Orleans and put himself into touch with Geyseric for a combined attack on Italy. But in 464 he died. His power descended to his son Syagrius, who maintained his independence as Roman king of Soissons until he was overthrown by Clovis in 486. Parallel in some ways to the position of Marcellinus and Agadeus is the beneficent theocracy which St. Severinus established about the same time in Noricum, a masterless province unprotected by Rome and harassed by the raids of the Rugi from the north of the river. The saint meditated for his people with the Rugian kings Flacethius and his successor Philetheus. He used his influence among the provincials of Noricum to secure the regular payment of tithes for the use of the poor. In famine and flood he helped his flock and kept the lamp of Christianity alight in a dark land. The death of the nominal emperor Severus in 465 made little difference in the history of the West. For two years after his death the West had no emperor of its own and the whole empire was nominally united under Leo I. Rissima was content to prolong an interregnum, which left him sole ruler. Gaiseric was still pressing for the succession of Olibrius, and Leo was at once unwilling to create an emperor who was likely to be a vassal of Gaiseric, and anxious to maintain the peace which existed between the Vandals and the Eastern Empire. Accordingly, he delayed the creation of a successor to Severus until Gaiseric in 467, impatient of the delay, delivered an attack on the Peloponnesus. Leo now felt himself free to act. He listened to the prayers of the Roman Senate and appointed as Emperor Anthemius, a son-in-law of the Emperor Marcion and a man of large experience who had held the highest offices of the Eastern Empire. The gift of Anthemius's daughter in marriage was intended to conciliate the support of Rissima, and East and West, thus united together on a firm basis, were to deliver a final and crushing attack on the Vandals, and to punish Gaiseric for the reign of terror he had exercised in the West ever since 461. In April 467, Anthemius came to Italy, escorted by Count Marcellinus and an army. By 468, a great armada had been collected to be launched against Carthage. The expenses were enormous. One office supplied £47,000 of gold, another £17,000 of gold, and £700,000 of silver. And this vast sum, which seems incredibly large, was furnished partly from the proceeds of confiscations and, and partly by the Emperor Anthemius. A triple attack was projected. On the side of the east, Basiliscus was to command the armada and to deliver an attack on Carthage, while Heraclius marched by land through Tripoli to deliver a simultaneous attack on the flank of the Vandals. On the side of the west, Marcellinus, conciliated by the eastern emperor who was not unwilling to see Dalmatia in the hands of a ruler practically independent of the west commanded a force which was destined to operate in Sardinia and Sicily. Once more however Gaiseric defeated his foes as in 442 and 461 
and once more treachery, perhaps instigated by the subtle vandal, proved the ruin of an expedition against Carthage. The Alan Aspar, Magister Militum per Orientum, frowned on an expedition which might render his master independent of his support, and already dubious of his ascendancy. He seems to have procured the nomination of Basiliscus as incapable procrastinator in order to ruin the success of the expedition. Rissima, Generalissimo of the West, was in a very similar position. He feared the success of the expedition because it might consolidate the power of Anthemius, and he hated with a personal hatred the Count Marcellinus, who commanded the Western forces. The inevitable result followed. Basiliscus was amused by Gaiseric with negotiations, and not unwillingly delayed, until Gaiseric sent fire ships among his armada, and destroyed the bulk of his ships while Marcellinus, after recovering Sardinia, was killed in Sicily by an assassin, in whom it is impossible not to suspect an agent of Rissima. The success gained by Heraclius, who had won Tripoli and was marching on Carthage, was neutralised. The destruction of Basiliscus's fleet and the assassination of Marcellinus involved the complete failure of the expedition. When one remembers that Aspar, Rissima and Gaiseric were all Arians, one almost wonders if the whole story does not indicate an Arian conspiracy against the Catholic Empire. But political existences are sufficient to explain the issue, and the real fact would appear to be that the two generalissimos of East and West were content to purchase their own security at the cost of the empire they served. End of section 50。section 51 of Cambridge Medieval History Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 51 Italy and the West, 410 to 476, by Ernest Barker Chapter 14, Part 5 Aspar indeed failed in the event to buy security, even at the price he had been willing to pay. In 471, Leo attempted a coup d'etat, Aspar fell, and the victorious emperor, who had already been recruiting Isaurians within his own empire in order to counteract and eventually supersede the dangerous influence of the German mercenaries, was able to continue his policy, and thus to preserve the independent existence of the Eastern Empire. With the West it was different. Here there was no substitute for Rissima and his Germans, here there was no elasticity which would enable the empire to recover, as it did in the east, from the loss of prestige and of resources involved by the disastrous failure of 468. For a time, indeed, Anthemius, with the support of the Senate, which had called him to the throne, and of the Roman party, which hated barbarian domination, struggled to make head against Rissima. The struggle partly turned on the course of events in Gaul. Here, Yorick, in 466, had assassinated his brother Theodoric II, as Theodoric had before assassinated his brother, Thorismud, a vigorous and enterprising king, the most successful of all the Visigothic rulers of Toulouse. Yorick immediately began, after the failure of the expedition of 468, to take advantage of the condition of the Western Empire in order to make himself ruler of the whole of Gaul. He may have hoped to gain the aid of the Gallo-Roman nobility, who were by no means friendly to the ascendancy of Rissima, and there were certainly Roman officials in Gaul, like Arvandus and Praefectus Praetorio, who lent themselves to his plans. <laughs> 
but Anthemius and the Senate saw the danger by which they were threatened. Arvandus was brought to Rome in 469, tried by the Senate and sentenced to death. A striking instance of the activity which the Senate could still display. And Anthemius attempted to gain the support of the nobility of Gaul by giving the title of Patricius to Edisius, the son of Avitus, and the office of Prefect of Rome to Sidonius Apollinaris. In spite of these measures, however, he failed to save Gaul from the Visigoths. In 470, Euric took the field, and defeating a Roman army, gained possession of Arles and other towns as the prize of his victory. Much of Auvergne also fell into his hands, but he failed to take its chief city, Clermont, where the valour of Edicius and the exhortations of Sidonius, newly consecrated bishop of the city, inspired a stout resistance. Yet Gaul was none the less really lost, and failure in Gaul meant for Anthemius ruin in Italy. Already in 471, civil war was imminent. Ricimer, seeing his chance, had gathered his forces at Milan, while Anthemius was stationed at Rome. Round the one was collected the army of Teutonic mercenaries. Round the other, though he was not popular in Catholic Italy, being reputed to be Hellenic and a lover of philosophy, there rallied the officials, the Senate and the people of Rome. Once more the old struggle of the Roman and barbarian parties was destined to be rehearsed. For a moment, the mediation of Epiphanius the saintly bishop of Pavia, procured, if we may trust the account of his biographer Anodius, a temporary peace. But in 472 war came. Early in the year, Rissima marched on Rome and besieged the city with an army, in which the Scyrian Odovacar was one of the commanders. For five months the city suffered from siege and from famine. At last an army which had marched from Gaul to the relief of Anthemius under the command of Bilima, the master of troops of that province, was defeated by Rissima and treachery completed the fall of the beleaguered city. In July, Rissima marched into Rome, now under the heel of a conqueror for the third time in the course of the century. And Anthemius, seeking in vain to save his life, by mingling in disguise with the beggars round the door of one of the Roman churches, was detected and beheaded by Rissima's nephew, Gundabad. Once more the empire seemed destroyed. Civil war, said Pope Galasius, had overturned the city and the feeble remnants of the Roman Empire. The death of Anthemius had already been preceded by the accession of Olibrius, the husband of Valentinian's daughter and the relative by marriage of Gaiseric. The circumstances of the accession of Olibrius are obscure. A curious story in a late Byzantine writer makes him appear in Italy during the struggle between Anthemius and Rissima, with public instructions from Leo to mediate in the struggle, but with a sealed letter to Anthemius, in which it was suggested that the bearer should be instantly executed. The letter is said to have fallen to the hands of Rissima, who replied by elevating Olibrius to the imperial throne. We can only say that Olibrius came to Italy in the spring of 472, whether sent by Leo or, as is perhaps more likely, invited by Rissima, and that he was proclaimed emperor by Rissima before the fall of Rome and the death of Anthemius. The reign of Olibrius, connected as he was with the old Theodosian house and with the Vandal rulers of Africa, seemed to promise well for the future of the West, but it only lasted for a few months. Short as it was, it saw the death of Rissima at the end of August 472, and the elevation in his place of his nephew Gundabad, a Burgundian. But though a nominal successor took his place, the death of Rissima left a gap that could not be filled. If he was a barbarian, he had yet in his way venerated the Roman name 
and preserved the tradition of the Roman Empire. He had sought to be emperor-maker rather than king of Italy, and for sixteen years he had kept the empire alive in the West. Within four years of his death, the last shadow of an emperor had disappeared, and a barbarian kingdom had been established in Italy. Olibrius died at the end of October 472. The throne remained vacant through the winter, and it was not until March of 473 that Gundabad proclaimed Glycerius emperor at Ravenna. But Gundabad soon left Italy, having affairs in Gaul, and Glycerius, deprived of his support, was unable to maintain his position. He succeeded indeed in averting one danger when he induced a body of Ostrogoths, who had entered Italy from the north-east under their king Widimir, to join their kinsmen, the Visigoths of Gaul. His position, however, had never been confirmed by the eastern emperor, and at the end of 473, Leo appointed Julius Nepos, the nephew of Marcellinus of Dalmatia, to be emperor in his place. In the spring of 474, Nepos arrived in Italy with an army. Glycerius could offer no resistance, and in the middle of June he was captured at Portus, near the mouth of the Tiber, and forcibly consecrated bishop of Salona in Dalmatia. The accession of Nepos seemed a triumph for the Roman cause, and a defeat for the barbarian party. Once more, as in the days of Anthemius, an emperor ruled at Rome, who was the real colleague and ally of the emperor of Constantinople. And Nepos, unlike Anthemius, had the advantage of having no master of troops at his side. With the aid of the Eastern Empire, and in the absence of any successor to Rissima, Nepos might possibly hope to secure the permanent triumph of the Roman cause in the West. But the aid of the Eastern Empire was destined to prove a broken reed, and Rissima was fated to find his successor. In 475, a revolt headed by Basiliscus drove Zeno, who had succeeded to Leo in 474, from Constantinople, and disturbed the East until 477. The West was thus left to its own resources during the crisis of its fate, and taking their opportunity, the barbarian mercenaries found themselves new leaders, and under their guidance settled its fate at their will. For the first few months of his reign, Nepos was left undisturbed, but even so he was compelled to make a heavy sacrifice, and to buy peace with Yorick at the price of the formal surrender of Auvergne, to the great relief of its bishop Sidonius. In 475, however, there appeared a new leader of the barbarian mercenaries. This was Orestes, a Roman of Pannonia, who had served Attila as secretary and had been entrusted by his master with the conduct of negotiations with the Roman Empire. On the death of Attila, he had come to Italy and having married a daughter of Romulus, an Italian of the rank of Cums, who had served under Aetius as ambassador to the Huns. He had had a successful career in the imperial service. He had risen high enough by 475 to be created Magister Militia by Nepos, and in virtue both of his official position and of a natural sympathy which his previous career must have inspired, he became the leader of the barbarian party. Once at the head of the army, he instantly marched upon Rome. Nepos, powerless before his adversary, fled to Ravenna, and unable to maintain himself there, escaped at the end of August 475 to his native Dalmatia, where he survived as an emperor in exile until he was assassinated by his followers in 480. At the end of October, Orestes proclaimed an emperor his son, a boy named Romulus after his maternal grandfather, and surnamed, perhaps only in derision and after his fall, Augustulus. Thus was restored the old regime of the nominal emperor, controlled by the military dictator, and for nearly a year 
this regime continued. But the barbarian mercenaries, the Rugi, Skiri and Heroli, were by no means contented with the old condition of things. Since the fall of Attila, they had emigrated so steadily into Italy from the northeast that they had become a numerous people, and they desired to find for themselves, in the country of their adoption, what other Germanic tribes had found in Gaul and Spain and Africa, a regular settlement on the soil in the position of hospites. They would no longer be cantoned in barracks in the Roman fashion. They desired to be free farmers, settled on the soil after the German manner, ready to attend the levy in time of need for the defence of Italy, but not bound to serve continually in foreign expeditions as a professional army. They accordingly asked of Orestes a third of the soil of Italy. They demanded that every Roman possessor should cede a third of his estate to some German hospice. It appears a modest demand when one reflects that the Visigoths settled by Constantius in southwestern Gaul in 418 had been allowed two-thirds of the soil and its appurtenant cattle and cultivators. But the cession of 418 had been a matter of free grant. The demand of 476 was the demand of a mutinous soldiery. The grant of southwestern Gaul had been the grant of one corner of the empire, made with the design of protecting the rest. The surrender of Italy would mean the surrender of the home and hearth of the empire. Orestes accordingly rejected the demand of the troops. They replied by creating Odovacar, their king, and under his banner they took for themselves what Orestes refused to give. Odovacar, perhaps a Scyrian by birth, and possibly the son of a certain Edico, who had once served with Orestes as one of the envoys of Attila, had passed through Noricum, where St. Severinus had predicted his future greatness, and come to Italy somewhere about 470. He had served under Rissima in 472 against Anthemius, and by 476 he had evidently distinguished himself sufficiently to be readily chosen as their king by the congeries of Germanic tribes which were cantoned in Italy. His action was prompt and decisive. He became king on the 23rd of August. By the 28th, Orestes had been captured and beheaded at Piacenza, and on the 4th of September, Paulus, the brother of Orestes, was killed in attempting to defend Ravenna. The Emperor Romulus Augustulus became the captive of the new king, who, however, spared the life of the handsome boy and sent him to live on a pension in a Campanian villa. While Odovacar was annexing Italy, Yorick was spreading his conquests in Gaul, and when he occupied Marseille, Gaul, like Italy, was lost. The success of Odovacar did not, however, mean the erection of an absolutely independent Teutonic kingdom in Italy, or the total extinction of the Roman Empire in the West, and it does not therefore indicate the beginning of a new era, in anything like the same sense as the coronation of Charlemagne in 800. It is indeed a new and important fact that after 476, there was no Western Emperor until the year 800. And it must be admitted that the absence of any separate Emperor of the West vitally affected both the history of the Teutonic tribes and the development of the papacy during those three centuries. But the absence of a separate Emperor did not mean the abeyance of the Empire itself in the West. The Empire had always been and always continued in theory to be, one and indivisible. There might be two representatives at the head of the imperial scheme, but the disappearance of one of the two did not mean the disappearance of half of the scheme. It only meant that for the future, one representative would stand at the head of the whole scheme, and that this scheme would be represented somewhat less effectively in that part of the empire which had now lost its separate head.
The scheme itself continued in the West, and its continued existence was acknowledged by Adovacar himself. Zeno now became the one ruler of the empire, and to him Odovacar sent the imperial insignia of Romulus Augustulus, while he demanded in return the traditional title of Patricius to legalise his position in the imperial order. The old Roman administration persisted in Italy. There was still a praefectus praetorio Italia, and the Roman Senate still nominated a consul for the West. Odovacar is thus not so much an independent German king as a second Rissima, a Patricius holding the reins of power in his own hands, but acknowledging a nominal emperor, with the one difference that the emperor is now the ruler of the East and not a puppet living at Rome or Ravenna. Yet after all, Odovacar bore the title of Rex. He had been lifted to power on the shields of German warriors. De facto, he ruled in Italy as its king, and while his legal position looks backwards to Rissima, we cannot but admit that his actual position looks forward to Alboin and the later Lombard kings. He is a janus like figure, and while we remember that he looks towards the past, we must not forget that he also faces the future. We must also insist that every vestige of a Western emperor had passed away. We may speak of Odovacar as Patricius. We must also allow that he spoke of himself as Rex. He is also of the fellowship of Yorick and Gaiseric, and when we remember that these three were ruling in Gaul and Africa and Italy in 476, we shall not quarrel greatly with the words of Count Marcellinus. Hesperium Romani gentis imperium, cum hoc augustulo perit, Guthorum de hinct regibus, Romam tenentibus. End of section 51。section 52 of Cambridge Medieval History, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Dan. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 52, Chapter 15, Part 1. The Kingdom of Italy under Odovacar and Theodoric by Maurice du Moulin. The time between the years 476 and 526 is a period of transition from the system of twin empires which existed from the time of Arcadius and Honorius to the separation of Italy from the rest of the empire. It is, for this reason, an interesting period. It marks the surrender by Constantinople of a certain measure of autonomy to that portion of the empire which finding that government under the faction set up after the death of Theodosius was impossible, had ended by submission to rulers nominated from Byzantium. It marks, too, the progress achieved by the barbarians, who, far from wishing to destroy a state of things which had formerly been hostile, adapted themselves to it readily when they had once risen to power, and showed themselves as careful of its traditions as their predecessors. It marks, further, the preponderant part played in the affairs of the time by a growing power, the Church, and the adaptability shown by her in dealing with kings who were heretics and avowed followers of Arius. The attempt to found an Italian kingdom was destined to speedy failure. There were too many obstacles in the way of its permanent establishment. Justinian, it is true, was to show himself capable of giving effectual support to the claims of Byzantium and of making an end of the Ostrogothic kingdom. But even his authority was powerless to bring about the union of the two portions of the Roman Empire. Another barbarian race, the Lombards, shared with the Papacy, the one authority which emerged victorious from these struggles, the possession of a country which, owing to the irreconcilable nature of the lay and the religious elements, was destined to recover only in modern times unity, peace, and that consciousness of a national existence which is the sole guarantee of permanence. 
Cassiodorus writes in his chronicle, In the consulate of Basiliscus and Amatus, Orestes and his brother Paulus were slain by Odovacar. The latter took the title of king, albeit he wore not the purple nor assumed the insignia of royalty. We have here, in the concise language of an analyst intent on telling much in a few words, the history of a revolution which appears to us, at this distance of time, to have been pregnant with consequences. The emperor, that Romulus Augustulus, whose associated names have so often served to point a moral, is not mentioned. It was left to Jordanes alone, a century later, to make any reference to him. The seizure of the supreme power by military leaders of barbarian origin had become since the time of Arisima a recognised process. It is, moreover, Orestes who was attacked by Odovacar, and Orestes was a simple patrician, and in no sense clothed with the imperial dignity. The empire itself suffered no change, it was merely that one more barbarian had come to the front. It was only when Odovacar was to set up pretensions to independent and sovereign authority that analysts and chroniclers were to accord him special mention on the ground that his claim was without precedent. Up to that point, his intervention was only one among many similar events which occurred in this period. Orestes was of Pannonian origin. He had acted as secretary to Attila, and whether Deco had taken a chief part in frustrating the conspiracy organised by Theodosius II against the life of the king of the Huns. After the death of the barbarian king, he entered the service of Anthemius, who appointed him commander of the household troops. He took part, under what circumstances we are ignorant, in the struggles which brought about the fall and the murder of Anthemius, an emperor imposed from Constantinople, the elevation and death of Olybrius, the short-lived rule of the Burgundian Gundobad, and the elevation of Glycerius. For the second time the East imposed an Augustus on the West, and Leo appointed Julius Nepos to rule at Rome. Under his reign, Orestes, who had been promoted to the rank of commander-in-chief, was charged with the task of transferring Auvergne to the Visigoth king Euric, to whom it had been ceded by the Roman government. How it came about that Orestes, instead of leading his army to Gaul, led it against Ravenna, and who induced him to attack Nepos, we have no documentary evidence to show. Nepos fled and retired to Salona, where he found his predecessor Glycerius, whom he had appointed to be bishop of that place. Having achieved this success, Orestes proclaimed as the new emperor Romulus Augustus, his son by the daughter of Count Romulus, a Roman noble. Even as Orestes had driven out Nepos, another barbarian, Odovacar, was before long to drive out Orestes and his son, and once more the contemporary documents afford no plausible explanation of this fresh revolution. Odovacar was a Rugian, the son of that Adico, Attila's general and minister. Odovacar had followed his father's colleague into Italy, where he occupied the humble position of spearman in the household troop, from which he gradually rose to higher rank. Whether the ambition which fired him was provoked by the spectacle of the internal conflicts in which he took part, or whether by the prediction of St. Severinus, the apostle of Noricum, it is impossible to say. It is, however, certain that in the lives of the saints there is a record to the effect that Severinus, in his hermitage of Favianum, was visited one day by certain barbarians who asked for his benediction before going to seek their fortunes in Italy, and one of them, scantily clad in the skins of beast, was of so lofty a stature that he was compelled to stoop in order to pass through the low doorway of the cell. The monk observed the movement and exclaimed, Go forward into Italy. Today thou art clothed in sorry skins, but ere long thou shalt distribute great rewards to many people. The man whom Severinus thus designated for supreme rule was Odovacar, the son of Edico. He appears to have enjoyed great popularity amongst the mercenary troops, 
and profiting by their discontent at the failure of Orestes to reward their devotion, he induced them to take active measures and gain to his side the barbarians of Liguria and the Trentino. Orestes declined the combat offered by Adovacar in the plains of Lodi, retreated behind the Lambro with the object of covering Pavia, and shortly afterward shut himself up in that city. Odovacar laid siege to him there, and Pavia, which, as Anodius tells us, had been pillaged by the soldiers of Orestes, was sacked by the troops of Odovacar. Orestes was delivered up to Odovacar, who had him put to death, 28th August, 476. Odovacar next marched on Ravenna, which was defended by Paulus, the brother of Orestes, and where Romulus had taken refuge. In a chance encounter which took place in a pine forest close to the city, Paulus was killed, and Odovacar occupied Ravenna, which had taken the place of Rome as the favourite residence of the Caesars of the West. Romulus, who had hidden himself and cast off the fatal purple, was brought before him. Odovacar, taking pity on his youth and moved by his beauty, consented to spare his life. He moreover granted him a revenue of 6,000 gold solidi and assigned him as his residence the Lucilanum, a villa in Campania near Cape Misenum which had been built by Marius and decorated by Lucullus. In succession to three emperors of the West who still survived, Glycerius and Nepos in Dalmatia and Romulus in Campania, Odovacar, styled by Jordanes king of the Rugians, by the anonymous Valacii king of the Tursilingi, and by other authorities prince of the Scyri, now wielded supreme power. At this point certain questions arise as to the nature of the authority which he exercised and to his relations with Byzantium and the established powers in Italy. The documents which supply an answer are scanty, The passages devoted to Odovacar give no details except such as relate to the beginning and end of his reign. It is plain too that the Latin writers of the time were more intent on pleasing Theodoric than on recording the facts of history. Cassiodorus has been careful to point out that Odovacar refused altogether to assume the imperial insignia and the purple robe and was content with the title of king. These events took place when Basiliscus, having driven Zeno from power, was reigning as emperor of the east, that is, at the moment of dynastic trouble in the other half of the empire. The possession of Ravenna, the exile of Romulus, and the death of Orestes did not suffice to secure to Adovacar the lordship of Italy. It was only after his formal entry into Rome and his tacit recognition by the Senate that he could look upon his authority as finally established. He was not, however, satisfied with this, but desired a formal appointment by the emperor and the recognition of his authority by Constantinople. A palace conspiracy which broke out in 477, having replaced Zeno on the throne of Byzantium, the ex-sovereign Romulus Augustulus, in spite of the fact that never having been formally recognised by the emperor, he had no legal claim to take such a step, sent certain senators as an embassy to Zeno. The representatives of the senate were instructed to inform the emperor that Italy had no need of a separate ruler, and that the autocrat of the two divisions of the empire sufficed as emperor for both, that Odovacar, moreover, in virtue of his political capacity and military strength, was fully competent to protect the interests of the Italian diocese, and under these circumstances they prayed that Zeno would recognise the high qualities of Odovacar by conferring on him the title of patrician and by entrusting him with the government of Italy. The emperor's reply was truly diplomatic. After severely censuring the Senate for the culpable indifference they had shown with respect to the murder of Anthemius and the expulsion of Nepos, two sovereigns who had been sent by the East to rule in Italy, he declared to the ambassadors that it was their business to decide on the course to be pursued, 
Certain members of the legation represented more especially the interests of Odovaka, and to them the emperor declared that he fully approved of the conduct of the barbarian in adopting Roman manners, and that he would forthwith bestow on him the well-merited title of patrician if Nepos had not already done so. Footnote. This is the first allusion to the promotion of Odovaka to the important office which, during the reign of Nepos, had been filled by Orestes. End footnote. And he gave them a letter for a Dovacar in which he granted him the dignity in question. Zeno, in short, had to recognise the fate accompli, the more so as the ambassadors from Rome to Byzantium had there found themselves in the presence of another mission sent from Dalmatia by Nepos to beg for the deposed sovereign the assistance of the newly restored emperor. He, however, could only condole with him on his lot and point out its similarity to that from which he himself had just escaped. There is yet another proof of the tacit recognition of Odovacar's authority. In 480, Nepos was assassinated by the counts Victor and Ovida, or Odiva, and in 481, as if he had been the legitimate heir of a predecessor whose death it was his duty to avenge, Odovacar led an expedition against the murderers, defeated and slew Ovida, and restored Dalmatia to the Italian diocese. More than this, Odovacar looked upon himself as the formally appointed representative of Zeno, for at the time of the revolt of Illus he refused to aid the latter, who had applied to him as well as to the kings of Persia and Armenia for assistance against the emperor. He had already exercised sovereign power in the cession of Narbonne to the Visigoths of Uric, and in the conclusion of a treaty with Gaiseric in 477, by the terms of which the king of the Vandals restored Sicily to the Italians, subject to the payment of a tribute, and retaining possession of a castle which he had built on the island. This is all we know till Theodoric appears upon the scene of the achievements of Odovacar. With respect to his relations with the inhabitants of Italy, we are better informed. In and after 482, the regular record of consuls, interrupted since 477, was resumed. The Roman administration continued to work as in the past. There was a praetorian prefect, Pelagius, who, like so many of his predecessors, contrived to exact contributions on his own behalf as well as on behalf of the state. The relations between Odovacar and the Senate were so intimate that together and in their joint names they set up statues to Zeno in the city of Rome. Between the church and Odovacar, albeit he was an Arian, no difficulties arose. The Pope Simplicius, 468-483, recognised the authority of Odovacar, and the king preserved excellent relations with Epiphanius, bishop of Pavia, and with St. Severinus, whose requests he was accustomed to treat with marked deference and respect. On the death of Simplicius in March 483, a meeting of the senate and clergy took place, and on the proposition of the praetorian prefect and patrician Basilius, it was resolved that the election of a new pope should not take place without previous consultation with the representative of King Odovacar, as he is styled without addition in the report of the proceedings. Further, future popes were bidden in the name of the king and under threat of anathema to refrain from alienating the possessions of the church. The picture of Italy under the government of Odovacar is difficult to trace. We have no Cassiodorus to preserve for us the terms of the decrees which he signed. Our only source of information, the works of Anodius, is by no means free from suspicion. If we are to believe the Bishop of Pavia, it was the evil one in person who inspired Odovacar with the ambition to reign. That he was a destroyer, populator intestinus, that his fall was a veritable relief, and that Theodoric was a deliverer. In short, that Ovacar was a tyrant in the full sense of the word. It must be remembered that it is the panegyrist of Theodoric who speaks in these terms. The word tyrant which he employs must be understood as the Byzantine historians understood it in its Greek sense, that is, in the sense of an authority set up out of the ordinary course. 
The specific charges of tyranny which are made against Odovacar are unconvincing, especially the accusation that he distributed amongst his soldiers a third of the land of Italy. We will deal later with the part played by Theodoric. It is not among these events that we must look for the cause of the fall of Odovacar. The only possible explanation lies in the fact that the Italians obeyed with alacrity, so soon as they were made clear, the orders of Constantinople on domestic affairs, holding themselves free to disobey them later on. And it was by the formal and specific authority of the Emperor that Theodoric was sent into Italy. Theodoric, an Amal by birth, was the son of Theodomir, king of the Goths, and his wife Erelieva. His father had discharged the duties of a paid warden of the marches on the northern frontiers of the Empire of the East. Theodoric, having been sent to Constantinople as a hostage, spent his childhood and youth in that city. He stood high in the favour of the Emperor Leo and became deeply imbued with Greek civilization. His education cannot, however, have advanced very far, as when he reigned in Italy he was unable to sign his name, and was compelled therefore to trace with his pen the first four letters cut out for the purpose in a sheet of gold. On the death of his father, having in his turn become king, Theodoric established his headquarters in Moesia, and found himself involved in a chronic struggle with a Gothic chief, Theodoric, the Squinter, Theodoric Strabo, who aspired to the kingly dignity. To accomplish this purpose, Theodoric Strabo relied on the goodwill of the eastern emperors. Having thrown in his lot with Basiliscus, he helped him to drive Zeno from the throne and received rewards in the shape of money and military rank. But when Zeno returned to power, it was Theodoric the Amal who in virtue of his fidelity stood highest in the imperial favour. Adopted by the emperor, loaded with wealth and raised to patrician dignity, he enjoyed from 475 to 479 great influence at the Byzantine court. He was given the command of an expedition sent to chastise Strabo, who had risen in revolt, and found his rival encamped in the Hemus. The men of each army were of kindred race, and Theodoric the Amal was compelled by his soldiers to form a coalition with the enemy. Till the death of Strabo, which occurred in 481, the two Theodorics intrigued together against the emperor, and with the emperor against each other, and there followed a series of reconciliations and mutual betrayals. From that time forward, Theodoric the Amal became a formidable power. He held Dacia and Mosia, and it was necessary to treat him with respect. Zeno nominated him for consul in 483, and in 484 he filled that office. It was in this capacity that he subdued the rebels Illus and Leontius, and on this ground he was granted in 486 the honour of a triumph and an equestrian statue in one of the squares of Byzantium. This accumulation of dignities conferred by Zeno concealed the distrust which he felt, and which before long he made manifest by sending Theodoric into Italy. Giordanes maintained that it was Theodoric himself who conceived the plan of the conquest of Italy, and that, in a long speech addressed to the emperor, he depicted the sufferings of his own nation which was then quartered in Illyria, and the advantages which would accrue to Zeno in having as his vice-regent a son instead of a usurper, and a ruler who would hold his kingdom by the imperial bounty. Certain authors, such as the anonymous Valesii and Paulus Diaconus, have transformed this permission granted by the emperor into a formal treaty, giving to Theodoric the assurance, says the former, that he should reign in the place of Odovacar, and recommending him, says the latter, after formally investing him with the purple, to the good graces of the senate. The explanation given by Procopius and adopted by Giordanes in another passage is, however, more plausible. Zeno, better pleased that Theodoric should go into Italy than that he should remain close at hand and in the neighbourhood of Byzantium, sent him to attack Odovacar. A similar method had been pursued with Widemir and Atalf in order to remove them to a distance from Rome. 
In any case, it was in the name of the emperor that Theodoric acted, and he held his power by grant from him. The title which he bore when he started from Constantinople, that of patrician, sufficed in his own opinion and that of Zeno to legalise his power and to clothe him with the necessary authority. It was the same rank as that borne by Odovacar. Later, like Odovacar, he aspired to something higher, and like him he was to fail in his attempts to obtain it. Zeno had no intention of yielding up his rights over Italy, and recognised no other than himself as the lawful heir of Theodosius. In 488, Theodoric crossed the frontier at the head of his Goths. It was the first step in the conquest which took five years to complete. Odovacar opposed him at the head of an army not less formidable but less homogeneous than that of his adversary. He was defeated on the Isonzo, he retreated on Verona, was once more beaten and fled to Ravenna. Theodoric profited by this error of tactics to make himself master of Lombardy, and Tufa, Odovacar's lieutenant in that district, came over to his side. This was merely a stratagem, as when Tufa was sent with a picked body of Goths to attack Odovacar, he rejoined him with his Ostrogoths at Faventia. In 490, Odovacar again took the offensive. He sallied from Cremona, retook Milan, and shut up Theodoric in Pavia. The latter would have been destroyed if the arrival of the Visigoths of Widomir and a diversion made by the Burgundians in Liguria had not left him free to rout Odovacar in a second battle on the Adda and to pursue him up to the walls of Ravenna. In August 490, Theodoric camped in the pine forest which Odovacar had occupied in his campaign against Orestes, and a siege began which was to last three years. In 491, Odovacar made a sortie in which, after a first success, he was finally defeated and the siege became a blockade. Theodoric, while keeping the enemy under observation, proceeded to capture other towns and to form various alliances. He seized Rimini and so destroyed the means of provisioning Ravenna, after which he opened negotiations with the Italians. Without asserting that Theodoric owed all his success to the church, the facts show pretty clearly that she afforded him, Arian though he was, like a Dovacar, valuable assistance. It was Bishop Laurentius who opened for him the gates of Milan, and it was he who, after the treason of Tufa, held for him that important city. Epiphanius, Bishop of Pavia, acted in a similar fashion. In a letter written in 492, Pope Galatius takes credit to himself for having resisted the orders of Odovacar, and finally it was another bishop, John of Ravenna, who induced Odovacar to treat. Theodoric, like Clovis, understood to the full the advantages which would accrue to him from the good offices of the Church. From his first arrival in Italy he showed in his attitude towards her the greatest consideration and tact. He was lavish in promises, he took pains to conciliate, and he did not despise the use of flattery. Thus, when he saw Epiphanius for the first time, he is said to have exclaimed, Behold a man who is not his peer in the East, to look upon him as a prize, to live beside him security. Again, he entrusts his mother and his sister to the care of the Bishop of Pavia, an act of high policy by which he added to the friendly feelings already exhibited towards him. The conquest of Italy was practically achieved between 490 and 493, and the various members of the nobility, such as Festus and Faustus Niger, and the chief senators rallied to his cause. With the capitulation of Odovacar, which took place at this latter date, the victory of Theodoric was complete. End of section 52「Section 53 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 53. The Kingdom of Italy, under Odoacer and Theodoric. <laughs> 
by Maurice Dumoulin. On the 27th of February, 493, through the good offices of John Bishop of Ravenna, who acted as official intermediary and negotiated the terms of the treaty, an agreement was concluded between Odoacer and Theodoric. It was arranged that the two kings should share the government of Italy and should dwell together as brothers and consuls in the same palace at Ravenna. Odoacer, as a pledge of good faith, handed over his son Thela to Theodoric. And on the 5th of March, the latter made his state entry into Ravenna. Theodoric broke the agreement by an act of the basest treachery. A few days later, he invited Odoacer, his son, his chief officers, to a banquet in that part of the palace known as the Lauritum. At the end of the feast, Theodoric rose, threw himself on Odoacer, and slew him together with his son. The chief officers of Theodoric's army followed his example and massacred the Rugian leaders in the banqueting hall, while in the interior of the palace and as far as the outskirts of Ravenna, the Gothic soldiery attacked the soldiery of Odoacer. It was clear that all acted on orders from headquarters. Theodoric had now no rival in Italy. He was not, however, equally successful in his attempts to obtain recognition as king by the emperor. He had already, during the first year of the siege of Ravenna, dispatched Festus to Constantinople, hoping that his position as chief of the senate would favor the success of his mission. On the completion of his conquest, Festus having in the meantime failed, Theodoric sent a fresh envoy, Faustus Niger. The second enterprise was, however, no less abortive than the first. The anonymous Velesi tells us, indeed, that peace having been made, had Theodoric then in the eyes of the emperor been guilty of disobedience? Anastasius sent back the royal insignia which Odoacer had forwarded to Constantinople. Nowhere, however, do we find it stated that the emperor had authorized Theodoric to assume them. In a letter written to Justinian to beg for his friendship, Athalaric records the benefits conferred by the court of Byzantium on his ancestors. He mentions adoption and the consulate, and in referring to the question of government, he merely recalls that his grandfather had been invested in Italy with the toga palmata, the ceremonial robe of clarissimi of consuls who triumphed. However that may be, Theodoric took that which was not conferred upon him. He abandoned military dress and assumed the royal mantle in his capacity of governor of the Goths and the Romans. But officially, he was not, any more than Odoacer had been king of Italy. Even his panegyrist in Odius, who styles him our lord the king, refers to the Italians as his subjects, accepts him as lord of Italy and de facto imperator, and speaks of him as clothed with the imperialis auctoritas, nowhere calls him king of Italy or king of the Romans. He was at once a Gothic king and a Roman official. Jordanus has called him quasi goturum romanorumque gobernator. We have proof of this double position in the two letters which he wrote to Anastasius and which are quoted by Cassiodorus. In the first, Theodoric expresses to the emperor the respect which he feels for the latter's counsels, and especially for the advice which he had given him to show favor to the senate. If he uses the word regnum, a word which may also mean nothing more than government, it is to tell the emperor that his object is to imitate the latter's system of governing. In the second letter, his tone is that of a lieutenant who begs his superior officer to approve the choice of a consul. It is the tone neither of a rebel, on the one hand, nor of an independent sovereign on the other. As the anonymous Velesi saw very clearly, Theodoric made no attempt to found a new state. He ruled two nations together without seeking to blend them, to allow one to absorb the other, or to make either subordinate. The Goths retained their own rights, their own laws, and their own officials. The Italians continued to be governed as they had been in the past, and the rule of Theodoric offers us the spectacle of a government purely Roman in character. The Goths had established themselves almost imperceptibly in Italy. As their king had been careful to maintain continuity of government, and Theodoric appears in the pages of contemporary writers 
as a sovereign whose habits and traditions were altogether Roman. The works of Enodius abound in evidence of this. His panegyric in particular, in which he represents Italy and Rome as loud in their praise of Theodoric because he had revived the old tradition and because he himself was a Roman prince whose ambition it was to place Italy in harmony with her past. This is the idea which dominates the pages of the famous Prosopopeia of the Adige. The government of Theodoric was then wholly Roman. He published laws and appointed consuls. He maintained and enforced Roman law, and the Edictum Theodorici was derived exclusively from Roman sources. He even imitated the imperial policy of encouraging barbarians in Italy, as when, for example, he established the Alemanni as guardians of the frontier. He also had a court, officials, and an administrative organization similar to that of Byzantium. He respected the Senate, restored the consular office, and though himself an Arian, intervened as arbitrator much as a Caesar would have done in the affairs of the church. Theodoric had a royal palace at Ravenna, and there held his court, Aula, surrounded by the chief men of Italy and his Gothic nobles. To enjoy interest at court was all important. No career was open to the man who did not attend there. He was unknown to his master, says Zenodius. The court was at once the home of good manners and the source of enlightenment, the center of state affairs, and a school of administration for the younger men. The court and the service of the palatium entailed certain functions, nearly all of which were discharged by Romans. The comes rerum privatarum, Apronianos held the office in the time of Enodius, had charge of the privy purse, and in his double capacity of censor and magistrate was responsible for the preservation of tombs and the administration of private justice. The comes patrimoni, Julianus, as steward of the royal domains, had under his orders the troublesome band of farmers of the revenue, conductores, and inspectors, charlotari. He had, moreover, supreme charge of the royal commissariat. The palace, with its magnificent gardens and sumptuously decorated apartments, was thronged with Roman nobles who came there in search of preferment. It was guarded by picked troops, and Ravenna was the headquarters of an important military district where the chief commands were filled by such men as Constantius, Agapitus, and Honoratus. There was not a Goth among them. If from the court we turn to the officials, we find again that they were all Romans. Among the ministers of the court of Theodoric, as would have been the case under the Roman administration, the most important was the Praetorian prefect Faustus, a personage of high consequence who, in right of his office, enjoyed a considerable police authority and extensive patronage. He was at the head of the postal administration, and to him was the final appeal in all criminal matters which arose in the provinces. His powers were almost legislative in character. In the forum, his jurisdiction was supreme and his person sacred. The comes sacrarum largitionum discharged the duties of finance minister, the questor, Eugenides was responsible in matters relating to jurisprudence and the framing of laws. Then came the treasury council, Marcellus, who filled a position coveted by the rising members of the bar and who acted as a sort of attorney general with respect to the estates of interstates and unclaimed assets. Next came the magister officiorum, and then the perequator whose business it was to adjust the incidence of taxation in the royal cities. Finally, the vicarius, the deputy in each diocese of the Praetorian prefect. We have here only specified some of those officials whose personal character have been depicted for us in the letters of Enodius. If we complete, and with the help of Cassiodorus it is possible to do so, the catalogue of government departments, both administrative and provincial, which existed in Italy under Theodoric, we might well imagine it to be a record not of the reign of a barbarian king, but of the times of Valentinian and Honorius. It was the Romans alone who struggled, and they did so with the greatest eagerness to obtain these posts. Did, for example, the office of treasury council fall vacant, the whole province was agitated by intrigues, and even bishops joined in the contest. The crowd of candidates for a minor office, such as 
Periquator, was so great that Enodius could not refrain from bantering Faustus on the subject. The cursus honorum of the principal officers of state during the forty years from Odoacer to the death of Theodoric proves that very little was altered in Italy during that period except the nationality of the ruler of the country. We find, for instance, that Faustus was successively consul, quaestor, patrician, and praetorian prefect, and was moreover entrusted with missions to Anastasius, while Liberius, who had remained faithful to Odoacer, and had even refused to surrender Cessna to Theodoric, was nevertheless employed by the latter sovereign, who made him a patrician and prefect of Ligurian Gaul. Cinerius, again, was employed first as a soldier, and then as a diplomat, and count of the patrimonium. Agapetus, another official, obtained the rank of patrician, held a military appointment at Ravenna, and was in turn consul, legate in the east, and prefect of the city. While Eugenides, whom Enodius styles the honor of Italy, became a vir illustris, and was employed as an advocate, a quaestor, and as master of the offices. Other examples might also be quoted. The readiness of these Italian noblemen to serve successively under both Odoacer and Theodoric arose from no feeling of indifference on their part, but must rather be attributed to the fact that these rulers were in no sense hostile to tradition, and because they continued the form of administration established by the Roman Empire. The Senate and the Consulate, those two institutions with which the whole history of the past had been so intimately connected, especially engaged the attention of Theodoric. Ever since the time of Honorius, the part played by the Senate in the government of Italy had been growing more and more important. After the death of Libius Severus, it had asked Leo for an emperor, while both Augustulus and Odoacer had entrusted it with a similar mission to Zeno. In a well-known novel, Majorian may be found thanking the Senate for his election and promising to govern according to its counsels. And when Anthemius was endeavoring to involve Ricimer in the struggle that was to end so fatally for himself, he lent for support upon the Curia. Examples such as these show that the Senate represented tradition. It was the single authority that remained unchanged through every vicissitude, and to it accordingly Theodoric at once made overtures. He entrusted a mission of considerable importance to two senators, Festus and Faustus, the former of whom occupied the position of chief of the senate, and on making his entry into Rome, his first visit was to the senate house. In fact, to make use of a saying of his own, as recorded by his panegyrist, he adorned the crown of the senate with countless flowers. He enrolled a few Goths among its members, but he only did this on rare occasions, for he preferred, as a rule, to recruit the senatorial ranks from among the old aristocracy of the country. During his reign, men became senators in three ways. They might either be co-opted, or else selected from a list of candidates nominated by the king, or they obtained the rank because they had been advanced to some dignity which conferred the title of illustrious. In Rome, indeed, the Senate at this time was the supreme power. In conjunction with the prefect, it had the control of the municipal police, it organized the games in the circus, and exercised authority over the city schools and working men's corporations. Without abandoning any of its legislative power, it assumed the functions of the Aediles, nor could a royal edict become law until it had received the senatorial sanction. The Varia of Cassiodorus are full of letters from Theodoric to the Senate. Indeed, he never made a nomination of any consequence or filled up an important office without immediately communicating the fact to the senators in the most deferential terms, and even soliciting their advice and approbation. A great deal of this deference was no doubt a mere form, but to a certain extent it was also sincere. The king's respect could hardly have been altogether feigned, for he invariably addressed even those senators who held aloof from his government in a kindly manner. Festus, for instance, although he remained in Rome and never visited Ravenna, obtained the rank of patrician and received no less than four letters from Theodoric, 
all expressed in the most flattering terms. While Symmachus, another patrician who refused to leave his native city, was favored with a royal letter praising the buildings which he had erected. In spite of these friendly relations, some opposition was aroused in the Curia by the question of the Arian schism. Indeed, towards the end of the king's reign, the behavior of the senators over this matter even provoked against him the hostility of Byzantium. Not only was this opposition a source of serious trouble to Theodoric, but it rendered him suspicious and cruel and caused him to act with great severity against some of the senatorial families and several victims, among whom Boethius was the most illustrious, were executed by his command. In the opinion of Theodoric, the consulship was as valuable as ever, though in reality it had lost a great deal of its former importance. As Justinian justly observes in an Authenticus, this office had originally been created to defend the state in time of war, but since the emperors had undertaken the business of fighting, the consulship had deteriorated into a means of distributing largesse among the people. Under these circumstances, candidates for the office were not very numerous. Enodius mentions the small number of aspirants for the consulship, while Marcion, in an official communication, expresses his indignation at the stinginess of the men holding this high office and obliges them to contribute a hundred pounds weight of gold for the purpose of repairing the aqueducts. The consulship indeed at this period had degenerated into a mere name. A formula of nomination, which has been preserved for us by Cassiodorus, merely recalls the fame of this magistracy in the past, and then goes on to point out that a consul's sole duty is to be magnanimous and not to be sparing with his money. However, the consul has no more authority. By the grace of God, the formula declares, we govern while your name dates the year. Your good fortune, indeed, is greater than that of the prince himself, for though endowed with the highest honors, you have been relieved of the burden of power. On the other hand, as if to make up for this loss of authority, the dress of a consul was sumptuous and magnificent. A spreading cloak hung from his shoulders. He carried a scepter in his hand and wore gilded shoes. In addition, he possessed the right of sitting in a curule chair and was allowed to make the seven processions in triumph through Rome of which Justinian speaks in one of his novels. Theodoric would have liked to restore the consulship to a somewhat more respected position. An eloquent letter on the subject of this magistracy was addressed by him to the emperor Anastasius, and when Avienus, the son of Faustus, became consul in 501, Enodius, who shared the opinion of his master, wrote as follows. If there are any ancient dignities which deserve respect, if it to be remembered after death is to be regarded as a great happiness, if the foresight of our ancestors really created something so excellent that by it humanity can triumph over time, it is certainly the consulship, whose permanence has overcome old age and put an end to annihilation. In his panegyric, moreover, Enodius praises Theodoric, because during his reign, the number of consuls exceeded the number of candidates for the office in previous times. The main outlines of Theodoric's government have now been described, and it will be seen that they were all of Roman origin. We must next inquire in what manner he administered this government. A judicious policy and gentle means had been employed to supplant Odoacer, and at the beginning of his reign he governed by similar methods. He endeavored to help the Italian officials with whom he had surrounded himself and to whom he had entrusted the high offices of state in their task of pacifying and reorganizing the country. When Epiphanius described the miserable plight of Liguria to him, told him in moving terms how the land there lay uncultivated, owing to its husbandmen having been carried away captive by the Burgundians, the king replied, There is gold in the treasury, and we will pay their ransom, whatever it may be, either in money or by the sword. He then suggested that the bishop should himself undertake negotiations for ransoming the captives. Epiphanius accepted this mission, and, the king having placed the necessary funds at his disposal, triumphantly brought home 6,000 prisoners, whom he had either ransomed 
or whose liberty he had obtained by his eloquent pleading in their behalf. The effect produced in Italy by such an act of liberality, followed by so satisfactory a result, can be imagined. The king's aim, indeed, as he told Cassiodorus, was to restore the old power of Italy, to re-establish a good government and to extend the influence of that Roman civilitas upon which he desired to model his own administration. As ministers, he selected men capable of inspiring confidence, such as Liberius, for instance, whose official work had been attended with such excellent results. In his opinion, fidelity to a vanquished patron was a virtue, nor was he afraid of praising it. Indeed, in his administration, the value of a post given to a son would be in proportion to the deserts of the father. He attracted young men capable of making good officers of state to his court. In a word, he acted like a sovereign who desires to be loved by his subjects, and at the same time to give stability to his rule. As in odious remarks, no man was driven to despair of obtaining honors. No man, however obscure, had to complain of a refusal to his demands provided that they rested on substantial foundations. No man, in fact, ever came to the king without receiving liberal gifts. But at this point we detect the panegyrist. As we shall see before long, the end of his reign differed from the beginning, but during the chief part of it, at any rate, he governed with singular prudence. When Laurentius begged Theodoric to pardon some rebellious subjects, the king answered him as follows. Your duty as a bishop obliges you to urge me to listen to the claims of mercy, but the needs of an empire in the making shut out gentleness and pity and make punishments a necessity. Nevertheless, we find that he allowed some mitigation to be made in the punishment of the culprits. Theodoric could be a just as well as a politic ruler, and he showed his sense of justice when he had to deal with financial questions. At the request of Epiphanius, he remitted two-thirds of the taxes for the current year to the inhabitants of Liguria, levying the remaining third, it is said, in order that the poverty of his treasury might not impose fresh burdens on the Romans. During his reign, even the Goths were obliged to submit to taxation, and he also made them respect the public finances. At Adria, for instance, he forced them to give back what they had taken from the fiscus. In Tuscany, he ordered Gesila, the Sajo, to make them pay the land tax. Moreover, if in any province the servant of the Gothic count or his deputy behaved violently to the provincials, we find Severianus giving information against them. While in Picenum and Samnium, we find him ordering his compatriots to bring grants made to the king to court, without keeping back any portion of them. Nevertheless, contemporary chroniclers have all declared that Theodoric, like Odoacer, distributed a third part of the land in Italy among his soldiers. Their statement appears to have been almost invariably accepted by later historians, who have repeated it one from another. A theory that the barbarians despoiled the conquered people of their states is commonly believed, and indeed has hardly ever been contradicted. But in addition to the fact that such a proceeding would certainly have led to some disturbance, of which we can find no evidence in any part of the country, Another circumstance renders such a conclusion unreasonable. This is that neither Odoacer's soldiers nor Theodoric's were in reality sufficiently numerous to occupy a third part of the land in Italy. Greek chronicles, it is true, speak of the Tritemorion ton agron, Latin writers of the Tertiae. But what are we to understand by these expressions? Among the few scholars who have attempted to dispute the current theory, some, like de Rosier, believe that the chronicler's words denote an act of confiscation for which compensation was made to the owners by a tax levied at the rate of one-third of the annual value. Others, like Lacrivain, consider that they mean a surrender of unappropriated land, in return for which a tribute was exacted equal to a third of the annual produce. At no period, not even during the agrarian troubles in the faraway days of the Republic, had it ever been the custom to eject legal proprietors from their estates. On the contrary, on every occasion 
when land had been required for the purpose of making grants to the plebeians, to veterans or praetorians, or even to barbarians, it had invariably been taken from land owned by the community, that is to say, from the land around the temples, from unoccupied land, or from the property of the treasury. Whenever indeed a distribution of land took place, it was made exclusively from the lands belonging to the treasury, which at certain periods multiplied exceedingly owing to the eschiated successions or confiscations. In our own opinion, it was a third of these state lands, this ager publicus, that was assigned to the barbarians during the reigns of Odoacer and Theodoric. In addition to the fact that not one of these texts actually contradicts this theory, it appears to be sufficiently proved by the following words addressed by Enodius to Liberius, when the latter was ordered to allot the land of Liguria to the Goths. Have you not enriched innumerable Goths with liberal grants, and yet the Romans hardly seem to know what you have been doing? Even the courtier like Enodius would not have expressed himself in this manner in a private letter, or even in an official communication, if private estates had been attacked for the benefit of the conquerors. During the early years of the Roman Empire, the annual food supply of Italy had always been one of the government's chief anxieties. And the writings of Cassiodorus constantly show us that Theodoric was not free from a similar care. His orders to his officials, however, on this subject appear to have been attended with excellent results. During his reign, according to the Anonymous, 60 measures of wheat might be purchased for a solidus, and 30 amphorae of wine might be had for a like sum. Paul the deacon has remarked the joy with which the Romans received Theodoric's order for an annual distribution of 20,000 measures of grain among the people. It was, moreover, with a view to making the yearly food supply more secure that the king caused the seaports to be put in good repair. And we find him especially charging Sebeniacus to keep those in the vicinity of Rome in good order. End of section 53「Section 54 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 54. Chapter 15. The Kingdom of Italy under Odoacer and Theodoric by Maurice Dumoulin. Part 2. At the same time, Theodoric gratified the ruling passion of the Italians for games in the circus, and Enodius, the Anonymous, and Cassidorus are unanimous in praising him for reviving the gladiators. From their pages we learn that he provided shows and pantomimes, that he endeavored to shield the senators from the abusive jests of the comedians, and that he brought charioteers from Milan for the consul Felix. But, in the eyes of his contemporaries, the most striking of all Theodoric's characteristics seems to have been his taste for monuments, for making improvements at Rome and Ravenna, and for works of restoration of every kind. Such a taste, indeed, was very remarkable in a barbarian. According to the Anonymous, he was a great builder. At Ravenna, the aqueducts were restored by his order and the plan of the palace which he constructed there has been preserved for a mosaic in San Apollinare Nuovo. At Verona, also, he erected baths and an aqueduct. Cassiodorus tells us how the king sought out skilled workers in marble to complete the Basilica of Hercules, how he ordered the patrician Symmachus to restore the theater of Pompey, how he bade Artemidorus rebuild the walls of Rome, and how he desired Argolicus to repair the drains in that city. We find him, moreover, requesting Festus to send any fallen marbles from the Pincian Hill to Ravenna, and giving a portico, or piece of ground surrounded by a colonnade, to the patrician Albinus, in order that he may build houses on it. Count Sona received directions to collect broken pieces of marble, in order that they might be used in wall building while the magistrates of a tributary town were required to send to Ravenna columns and any stones from ruins that had remained unused. 
In fact, Enodius's statement that he rejuvenated Rome and Italy in their hideous old age by amputating their mutilated members is perfectly correct in spite of its rhetorical style. Not a few of his orders, moreover, bear witness to a care for the future. The Goths of Dertona, for instance, and of Castellum Veruca were commanded to build fortifications. The citizens of Arles were directed to repair the towers that were falling into decay upon their walls, and the inhabitants of Feltre were ordered to build a wall around their new city. He even looked forward to his own death, building that strange mausoleum now become the Church of Santa Maria della Rotunda, whose monolithic roof is still an object of wonder. Enodius also tells us that Theodoric encouraged a revival of learning. Nor is this eulogy by any means undeserved, for a real literary renaissance did in fact take place during his reign. In addition to Cassiodorus himself, to Enodius, who was at once an enthusiastic lover of literature, an orator, a poet, and a letter writer, and to Boethius, the most illustrious and popular writer of his day, quite a number of other distinguished literary men flourished at that time. Rusticus Helpidius, for instance, the king's physician, has left a poem entitled The Blessings of Christ. Cornelius Maximianus wrote idyllic poetry, while Arator of Milan translated the Acts of the Apostles into two books of hexameters. The greatest poet of this period was Venantius Fortunatus, who became Bishop of Poitiers, and mention should also be made of the lawyer Epiphanius, who wrote an abridgment of the ecclesiastical histories of Socrates, Sozomen, and Theodoret. Theodoric was himself an Arian, yet he was always ready to extend his protection to the Catholic Church. Indeed, as we have already noticed, it was his policy to win over the bishops of northern Italy. Accordingly, he granted complete liberty of worship to all Catholics, while so long as papal elections were quietly conducted, as in the cases of Gelasius and Anastasius II, he took no part in them. But should a pontifical or episcopal election lead to disturbances of any kind, more especially if such disturbances were likely to end in a schism, Theodoric at once intervened in them in the character of arbitrator or judge, for he claimed to be dominator rerum, that is to say, the sovereign, responsible for the maintenance of order in the state, the successor indeed of the Caesars, who had always considered the task of maintaining the integrity of the faith as their most especial prerogative, and he assumed such a position at the time of the Laurentian schism. In the year 498, two priests, Laurentius and Symmachus, had been simultaneously elected by rival parties to the Roman See. As neither prelate was willing to resign his claim to profit by the election, the dispute was referred to the Gothic king, who decided that whichever candidate had obtained a majority of votes should be proclaimed bishop of Rome. This condition being fulfilled by Symmachus, he was accordingly recognized as pope, while Laurentius was given the bishopric of Nuceria as a compensation. By this arrangement, peace, it was believed, was again established, and in the year 500, Theodoric paid a visit to Rome, where he was enthusiastically received by Pope, Senate, and people. But the schism was by no means at an end. On the contrary, the enemies of Symmachus lost no time in renewing their attack with redoubled vigor, and accusations of adultery, of alienating church property, and of celebrating Easter on the wrong date were successively brought against the Pope. Theodoric summoned the accused pontiff to appear before him, and when Symmachus refused to comply with this command, the case was referred to an assembly over which Peter of Altinum presided as visitor. No less than five synods were convoked for the purpose of settling this question, and it was eventually terminated by the acquittal and rehabilitation of Symmachus. The debates held in these ecclesiastical assemblies were very stormy. The partisans on both sides appear to have been equally unwilling to give way, nor did they scruple to promote their cause by exciting riots in the streets or by slanderous libels. Both parties, indeed, seem to have been mainly occupied with justifying themselves in Theodoric's eyes, in order that they might obtain his support. In fact, from the Second Synod onwards, the friends of Laurentius adopted the tactics of attempting to prove that Symmachus and his adherents had disobeyed the orders of the king. In every phase of this controversy, 
so full of information respecting the relations of church and state at that period, Theodoric, it will be seen, occupies an important place. In Rome, troubles were temporarily smoothed over by his presence, while his departure, on the other hand, proved the signal for a fresh outbreak. Appeals for a peaceful settlement, expressed with increasing vigor and mingled with reproofs of increasing sternness, fill his letters at this time. When the hostile parties, unable to come to any decision on their own account, referred the question to their sovereign, he reminded them of their duty in the following severe words, We order you to decide this matter which is of God, and which we have confided to your care, as it seems good to you. Do not expect any judgment from us, for it is your duty to settle this question. Later, as a verdict still failed to make its appearance, he writes again, I order you to obey the command of God. And this time he was obeyed. The fact that Theodoric was himself an Arian never seems to have limited his influence in any way during this long quarrel, so celebrated in the history of the church. His prerogative as king gave him a legitimate authority in ecclesiastical matters, nor does that authority ever appear to have been called in question on the ground that he was a heretic. On the contrary, we find him giving his sanction to canons and decrees exactly in the same manner as his predecessors had done in the days of the dual empire. But, though his words were sometimes haughty and peremptory, he was careful not to impose his own will in any matters concerning faith or discipline. Indeed, the most extreme action that can be laid to his charge is the introduction into the Roman synods of two Gothic functionaries, Gudilla and Bedkolfus, for the purpose of seeing that his instructions were not neglected. A similar wise impartiality, mingled with firmness, distinguished his dealings with the clergy. When a priest named Aurelianus was fraudulently deprived of a portion of his inheritance, restitution was made to him by order of the king. He assisted the churches to recover their endowments. He appreciated good priests and did them honor. Occasionally, indeed, he deposed a bishop for a time, on account of some action having been brought against him, but he always had him reinstated in his see as soon as he had proved his innocence. When he desired to give some compensation to the inhabitants of a country over which his troops had marched, he placed the matter in the hands of Bishop Severus, because that prelate was known to estimate damages fairly. And when a dispute arose between the clergy and the town of Sarsena, he ordered the case to be tried in the bishop's court, unless the prelate himself should prefer to refer it to the king's tribunal. Finally, he made it a rule that ecclesiastical cases were only to be tried before ecclesiastical judges. The foreign policy of Theodoric was conducted in the same masterly manner as his home government, or his dealings with the church. He appears to have exercised a kind of protectorate over the barbarian tribes upon his frontiers, especially over those of the Arian persuasion, nor did he hesitate to impose his will upon them if necessary by force of arms. As he had only daughters, he was obliged to consider the question of his successor, and the marriages which he arranged for his children or other relations were accordingly planned with a view to procuring political alliances. Of his daughters, the eldest, Aravagni, was married to Alaric, king of the Visigoths. The second, Theodegatha, became the wife of Sigismund, son of Gundabad, king of the Burgundians. And the third, Amalasuntha, was given in marriage to one of Theodoric's own race, the Amal Eutharic. Other alliances were formed by the marriage of his sister, Amalafrida, to Thrasimund, king of the Vandals, and another sister, Amalaberga, to Hermanfred, king of the Thuringians, while Theodoric himself wedded Childeric's daughter, Autofleda, the sister of Clovis. These alliances were all made with the definite object of extending Theodoric's sphere of action. Sic per circuitum placuit omnibus gentibus, says the anonymous. But when, as for example in the case of the Franks, they failed to attain the end desired by the king, they were never permitted to hamper schemes of an entirely contrary nature. A simple enumeration of Theodoric's wars is alone sufficient to prove the firmness of his will. When he found that Noricum and Pannonia, two provinces on the Italian frontier, were not to be trusted, he attacked and killed a chieftain of freebooters named Mundo in the former province. As the emperor Anastasius was supporting Mundo, 
and had recently dispatched a fleet to plunder on the coasts of Calabria and Apulia, such an attack gave Theodoric an opportunity of asserting his independence. Moreover, in order to render his demonstration even more effective, he collected a fleet of his own, which he sent to cruise in the Adriatic. At the same time, he took Pannonia from the Jepid king Traceric, and thus effectively secured his northeastern frontiers. Those on the northwest next engaged his attention, and here he protected the Alemanni from the attacks of Clovis, and eventually settled them in the province of Raetia. Finally, he took advantage of the wars between the Franks and the Burgundians to secure the passes of the Grayan Alps. Theodoric had striven to prevent hostilities from breaking out between the Franks and the Visigoths, but after Alaric's death at the Battle of Vuil, 507, he found himself obliged to take the latter people under his own protection. In the war that ensued, Ibas, one of his generals, defeated the eldest son of Clovis near Arles, 511, took possession of Provence, secured Septimania for the Visigoths, and established Amalric in Spain. Among more distant nations, we find the Estonians on the shore of the Baltic paying him a tribute of amber, while the deposed prince of Scandinavia found a refuge at his court. History, as may be seen from these events, fully corroborates the legends in which Theodoric is represented as a protector of barbarian interests and chief patron of the Teutonic races. In the Nibel Lungenlied, for instance, we find him occupying a distinguished place under the name of Dietrich of Bern, Theodoric of Verona. At the time of his death, his dominions included Italy, Sicily, Dalmatia, Noricum, the greater part of what is now Hungary, the two Raetias, Tyrol and the Grissons, Lower Germany, as far north as Ulm, and Provence. Indeed, if his supremacy over the Goths in Spain be also taken into account, it will be seen that he had succeeded in re-establishing the ancient Western Empire for his own benefit, with the exceptions of Africa, Britain, and two-thirds of Gaul. So far as we have examined it, Theodoric's government has been found invariably broad-minded and liberal, but it was destined to undergo a complete change during the latter years of his reign. Whether this change was a consequence of a relapse into barbarism, or whether, as seems more probable, it must be attributed to the persecution under which the Aryans were suffering in every part of the empire, is not easy to determine, for no definite information on this point is to be found in any of the texts. In any case, however, there can be no doubt that it was the religious question that produced this complete change of policy. On this point, the anonymous is perfectly clear, and if we disregard the severity and the cruelty of his punishments, and at the same time make due allowance for the intrigues of the Byzantine court and of the church itself, the precise nature of which cannot be determined, it does not appear that the king was himself to blame. Footnote. The following saying of Theodoric's should not be forgotten. We cannot impose a religion by force, since no one can be compelled to believe against his will. End of footnote. During his reign, we find the Jews enjoying an extraordinary amount of protection, and in one of his edicts, he testifies with what obedience this people had accepted the legal position assigned to them by the Roman law. His son-in-law, Eutharic, however, appears to have been addicted to persecution, and during his consulship, the Christians of Ravenna made an attempt to force all the Jews in their city to submit to the rite of baptism. As the Jews refused to comply, the Christians flung them into the water, and in spite of the king's decrees and the orders of Bishop Peter, attacked and set fire to the synagogues. Upon this, the Jews complained to the king at Verona, who ordered the Christians to rebuild the synagogues at their own expense. This command was carried out, but not before a certain amount of disturbance had aroused Theodoric's suspicions, and in consequence the inhabitants of Ravenna were forbidden to carry arms of any kind, even the smallest knife being prohibited. While these events were in progress in the year 523, the Emperor Justin prescribed Arianism throughout the empire. Such an action was a direct menace to the Goths, and Theodoric felt it very acutely. The painful impression which it produced on him was probably much increased by the fact that Symmachus's successors in the papal chair had not been as tolerant as their predecessor, while one of them in particular, John I, had shown a most bitter enmity towards heresy. 
We have no certain knowledge as to whether the Senate was in sympathy with Theodoric on this occasion, or whether it approved of Justin's measure, but the most probable theory seems to be that the Curia was on Justin's side, and that Theodoric, moreover, was aware that this was the case. At any rate, when the senator Albinus was denounced by Cyprian for carrying on intrigues with Byzantium, the accusation found ready credence at court. The anonymous declares, besides, that the king was angry with the Romans, and it is difficult to see why he should have been thus angry unless the Romans had been approving of Justin's religious decrees. On the other hand, if any plot had existed in the real sense of the term, it is not probable that such a man as Boethius, the master of the offices, that is to say, one of the chief officers of the crown, would have endeavored to shield Albinus by saying, Cyprian's accusation is false, but if Albinus has written to Constantinople, he has done so with my consent and with that of the whole Senate. He might perhaps have spoken in such a manner for the purpose of expressing his own and his colleagues' approval of a religious decree promulgated by a sovereign to whom they owed allegiance. Boethius, indeed, had himself just published a work against Arianism entitled De Trinitate, but it does not seem likely that he would have talked in this fashion had a conspiracy really been brewing. In any case, he was at once thrown into prison and is said to have composed his work De Consolazione, while in captivity. In the end, after a brief trial, he was put to death with every refinement of cruelty, while not long afterwards his father-in-law Symmachus met with a similar fate. Theodoric, indeed, understood very well that his whole life work was likely to be compromised by this readiness on the part of his subjects to accept Justin's edict. For what would become of his authority if it became the fashion to criticize him on account of his faith? It was in the hope of finding some remedy for this situation that he summoned Pope John to Ravenna, and from thence dispatched him, accompanied by five bishops and four senators, on an embassy to Constantinople. The king charged this mission, among other things, with the task of requiring the emperor to reinstate the outcast Arians within the pale of the church. But the emperor, though willing enough to make concessions on any other subject, would concede nothing to the Arians and the mission was forced to leave Constantinople without obtaining any redress on this point. As for Pope John, he died almost immediately after his return to Italy, and as his biographers tell us that he worked numerous miracles after his death, we may conclude that this sectarian quarrel must have been very acute. The failure of this embassy made Theodoric so furious that he allowed an edict to be published during the consulship of Olybrius by Symmachus, the chief official in the Scole, which stated that all Catholics were to be ejected from their churches on the seventh day of the Calends of September. But on the very day fixed upon by his minister for the execution of this act of banishment, the king died, apparently from an attack of dysentery, in the year 526. The Byzantine historian Procopius, though he was himself an opponent of the king's, has summed up Theodoric and his work in the following verdict, which remains true in spite of the errors committed by him during the latter years of his reign. His manner of ruling over his subjects was worthy of a great emperor, for he maintained justice, made good laws, protected his country from invasion, and gave proof of extraordinary prudence and valor. Theodoric's work was not destined to survive his death. He left a daughter, Amalasuntha, the widow of Eutheric, who was not unlike him, and who now became guardian to her son, Athalaric, to whom his grandfather had bequeathed the crown on his deathbed. She had been educated entirely on Roman lines and understood the value of her father's work, but she had to reckon with the Goths. During Theodoric's lifetime, this people had done nothing to excite attention and had lived side by side with the Romans without showing any desire to obtain the upper hand. But under the regency of a woman, we find that they soon aspired to play a more important part. Their first step was to take Athalaric from the guardianship of his mother. He died, however, in 534. Amalasuntha was now confronted once again with her former difficulties, and in the hope of overcoming them, she attempted to share the crown with Theodoric's nephew Theodahad, a man of weak and evil character. The new king's first care was to get rid of Amalasuntha, and he had her shut up on an island, in the lake of Bolsina, 
From her prison, she appealed to Justinian for assistance. When this came to Theodahad's ears, he had her strangled. But her cry for help had not been unheeded. By the death of Anastasius, the situation at Constantinople had been completely changed. It was no longer the imperial policy to allow Italy to be governed by a vassal, more especially if that vassal were an Arian, and political and religious motives alike urged Justinian to intervene. A struggle began accordingly, which was to last from 536 to 553, which was to devastate Italy with fire and bloodshed, and which ultimately opened the door for a new invasion by the Lombards. End of section 54. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 55 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 55, by E. W. Brooks. Chapter 16. The Eastern Provinces from Arcadius to Anastasius. By the death of Theodosius, the eastern throne passed to his incapable elder son, Arcadius, then seventeen years old. While the practical administration was in the hands of the praetorian prefect, Rufinus of Aquitaine, a man of vigor and ability who in the pursuit of ambition and avarice was not limited by scruples. Under these circumstances, a conflict was likely to arise between Rufinus and Stilicho, who was the guardian of the western emperor Honorius, and husband of Theodosius's niece, who also asserted that Theodosius had, on his deathbed, committed both his sons to his care. Rufinus proposed to counterbalance the advantage which his rival possessed in his connection with the imperial family by marrying Arcadius to his own daughter. But unfortunately for him, he had a rival at court in the eunuch Eutropius, a former slave who had risen to the position of Prepositus Sacri Cubiculi, who now profited by the prefect's absence to thwart his scheme. Lucian, whom Rufinus had made count of the East, had refused a request of Eucarius, the emperor's great uncle, and, upon Arcadius complaining of this, the prefect, to show his own loyalty, made a hasty journey to Antioch and put Lucian to a cruel death. Meanwhile, Eutropius induced Arcadius to betroth himself to Eudoxia, daughter of Bauto the Frank, who had been brought up by a son of Promotus, an enemy of Rufinus, who thus had the mortification of seeing his master united not to his own daughter, but to one who from her upbringing would be bitterly opposed to him. The inferiority of Rufinus was increased by the fact that the best of the eastern troops had accompanied Theodosius to the west, and of these only some of the less efficient had been sent back. The Visigothic Federati had, however, returned to Moesia, and their leader, Alaric, who was now proclaimed king, was quick to profit by the weakness of the government. Professing indignation at not being appointed Magister Militum, he invaded Thrace and advanced to Constantinople, while Rufinus, having also to meet an incursion of Caucasian Huns into Asia Minor and Syria, where Antioch was threatened and old Tyre abandoned by its citizens, had no forces to oppose him. He therefore went to the Gothic camp, and, after some negotiations, Alaric withdrew to Macedonia, and after a check from the local forces at Peneus, passed into Thessaly. Stilicho, who, besides desiring to overthrow Rufinus, wished to reunite eastern Illyricum to the western power, treated this as a pretext for interference, and starting in early spring he marched with considerable forces to Thessaly, and met the Goths in a wide plain. Probably, however, he did not wish to crush them, and after some months had been spent in skirmishes or negotiations, Rufinus, who feared Stilicho more than Alaric, sent him in the emperor's name in order to evacuate the dominions of Arcadius and send back the eastern troops. To break openly with the east at this time did not suit Stilicho's purpose, and as the eastern forces which comprised a large Gothic contingent were devoted to him, he could attain his primary object in another way. He therefore returned at once, while the eastern army under Gainus the Goth marched to Constantinople. In accordance with custom, the emperor, accompanied by Rufinus, came out to meet the troops, and the soldiers at a signal from Gainus, fell upon the prefect and cut him to pieces. The emperor's chief adviser was now Eutropius, who appropriated a large part of Rufinus's property and procured the banishment of the two most distinguished generals in the east, Abundantius and Timasius, while he entrusted positions of power to such obscure men as Hosius the Cook and Leo the Woolcomer. He also gained much obloquy by selling offices, though as the prices were fixed and there was no system of public loans, this was only a convenient method of raising money. As a eunuch, he could not hold any state office, 
But for this, he partly compensated by transferring some of the powers of the prefect to the master of the offices, and by interfering in matters altogether outside the functions of the chamberlain. Thus he is said to have acted as a judge, probably on special commission, and to have gone on embassies to the Goths and Huns, from which he returned with military pomp. Finally, he was made a patrician and assumed the consulship, though his name was not admitted to the western fasti. At first, he was necessarily on good terms with the army, and therefore with Stilicho, but he was no more inclined than Rufinus had been to allow the western regent to direct eastern affairs, and the previous position therefore soon recurred. After Stilicho's retreat, Greece lay at Alaric's mercy, for, perhaps because the army was too much under Stilicho's influence, no force was sent against him, and through the unguarded Thermopylae he marched plundering into Boeotia. Thebes, indeed, was too strong to take, and Athens he entered only under a capitulation. Megara, however, was taken, and, the Isthmus being left undefended, Corinth, Argos, and Sparta also. During 396, Peloponnesus lay under his heel, but early in 397, Stilicho, secure in the support of the eastern army, thought the time had come for another campaign. This time he came by sea to Corinth and, marching westwards, blockaded the Goths at Folo and Ellis. But Eutropius opened negotiations with Gildo, Count of Africa, whose loyalty had long been doubtful to induce him to transfer his allegiance to Arcadius. And the threatening state of affairs made it necessary for Stilicho to return. He allowed Alaric to withdraw to Epirus, probably on the understanding that he would keep the eastern court occupied. Eutropius, however, preferred to satisfy him by the post of Magister Militum in Illyricum and on these terms peace was concluded. Such being the relations between the two courts, it is not surprising to find that some of the eunuch's enemies conspired with the Goth soldiers, the allies of Stilicho, against his life, and that, with the fate of Rufinus before him, he tried to prevent such plots by a law of extraordinary severity. Perhaps for the same reason that no army was sent against Alaric, no support was given to Gildo, but his revolt occupied Stilicho's attention during most of 398. The pacification of Africa was, however, soon followed by Eutropius's fall. Gainus, now Magister Militum, had been strengthening his own position by filling the army with Goths from Moesia, and in spring of 399 an opportunity for action presented itself. Tribigild, commander of the Gothic colonists in Phrygia, having been refused a donative by Eutropius, revolted and ravaged the country, upon which Eutropius offered the money. But Tribigild raised his demands and insisted upon the eunuch's deposition. Gainus, with Leo, the satellite of Eutropius, was sent against him, but while Leo advanced toward the disturbed district, Gainus remained at the Hellespont. Tribigild, on hearing of Leo's approach, marched through Pisidia to Pamphylia, where a large part of his army was cut to pieces by a rustic force under Valentinius, a citizen of Salga, and the rest blockaded between the Avrimathon and the Melas. Leo moved to support the local force, but as he was too indolent and dissolute to maintain discipline, Tribigild was able, by an unexpected attack, to make his way through, while the disorderly forces scattered in all directions, Leo himself perishing in the flight. Tribigild then returned to Phrygia, which he again plundered. Nor was he the only enemy with whom the empire had to contend, for besides the constant incursions of the desert tribes into Egypt and Libya, the Huns were ravaging Thrace, and Vram Japu of Armenia was, at the instigation of the Persian king, attempting to annex the five satrapies north of the Tigris. Accordingly, Gainus, with much show of reason, represented to Arcadius that his best course was to grant Tribigild's demand, and, as Eudoxia urged the same, his consent was easily obtained. Eutropius was deposed from his office, and though he had abolished by legal enactment the right of sanctuary possessed by the churches, fled to the altar of St. Sophia, where the bishop, John Chrysostom, who owed his appointment to the eunuch, made use of his presence to preach on the vanity of earthly things, but resisted all attempts to remove him. Finally, he left the church on a promise that his life should be spared, but was deprived of property and honors and banished to Cyprus. As, however, Gainus insisted upon the necessity of his death, he was, on the pretext that the promise applied only to Constantinople, brought back to Chalcedon, tried on a charge of using imperial ornaments, and beheaded. The fall of Eutropius had been effected by a combination between Eudoxia and Gainus, and during the absence of the Goth, who had returned to Phrygia, the empress secured the appointment of Aurelianus to the prefecture in the preference of his brother Caesarius, who was supported by Gainus. After Eutropius's death, she further had herself proclaimed Augusta, and by an innovation which called forth a protest from Honorius, her busts were sent round the provinces like those of emperors. 
but Gainas had not designed to set Eudoxia in the place of Eutropius. Accordingly, he sent Tribigild, with whom he had joined forces, to Lampsicus, while he himself returned to Chalcedon, and demanded the surrender of three of the principal supporters of the Empress, Aurelianus the Prefect, Saturninus an ex-council, and Count John, her chief favorite. Resistance was useless, and Aurelianus and Saturninus crossed to Chalcedon, while John hid himself, probably in a church, but his hiding place was discovered, and the bishop's enemies afterwards asserted that he had betrayed them. The three men were ordered to prepare for death, but when the executioner's sword was at their necks, Gainas stayed his hand and had them conveyed by sea towards the Adriatic, perhaps intending to place them in the hands of Stilicho or Alaric. He next demanded a meeting with the emperor, which took place at Chalcedon, where they both gave mutual oaths of good faith in the church of St. Euphemia. Both the Goth leaders then crossed to Europe. Caesarius was made prefect, and in consequence of the recent troubles was compelled to increase the taxation. But in systematizing the sale of offices by limiting the tenure of each, he seems to have performed an act of advantage to the state and justice to the purchasers. Meanwhile, Gainus was so distributing the Roman troops in the city as to place them at the mercy of the Goths. And then, thinking his will law, he asked that a church within the wall should be given to the Arians. This time, however, the strong orthodoxy of Arcadius and the influence of the bishop caused the demand to be refused. The violent hostility aroused by these events made men believe that the Goths intended to attack the palace, while they, on their side, were seized with a panic which led them to expect an attack from forces which did not exist. Accordingly, Gainus, alleging ill health, retired to the suburban church of St. John, instructing his men to come out singly, and joined him. After the greater part had left the city, a trivial occurrence brought on a scuffle between Goths and the citizens, who attacked the already panic-stricken barbarians with any weapon they could find, and at last the gates were shut, and the Goths, enclosed within the city, without cohesion and without leaders, offered little resistance and were mercilessly massacred, while Arcadius found courage to declare Gainus a public enemy and send his guards to support the populace. Next day the survivors, who had fled to a church that the bishop had given to the Orthodox Goths, were surrounded by the soldiers and, though none dared to attack them in the church, the roof was stripped off and burning wood thrown in until all perished, in spite of the appeals of Caesarius for a capitulation. The Roman troops were now collected and placed under Fravita, a local pagan goth who had distinguished himself in the time of Theodosius. The attempts of Gainus on the Thracian cities failed, Tripigild was killed, and the lack of provisions compelled the Goths to withdraw to the Chersonese in order to cross to Asia, but Fravita had already placed a fleet on the Hellespont to intercept them. They were, however, forced to attempt the passage in rafts, and, these being sunk, most of them were drowned, while Gainus, with the survivors, retreated across the Danube, where he was attacked and killed by Olden the Hun, who sent his head to Constantinople, where it was carried through the city. Shortly before the victory, Aurelianus and other hostages escaped from their guards in Epirus and returned to the capital, and in early 401, Caesarius was deposed and imprisoned, and Aurelianus restored. Some deserters and fugitive slaves, who continued to ravage Thrace, were put down by Frevita, but he was accused of not pressing his advantage against the Goths and, though acquitted, incurred Eudoxia's enmity and afterwards fell a victim to the machinations of her satellites. Stilicho's hopes of directing eastern affairs through the army were thus destroyed, and soon afterwards the government was delivered from Alaric, who, having exhausted eastern Illyricum, invaded Italy, and after an indecisive battle at Polentia, was established in western Illyricum as Magister Militum probably on the understanding that he would help Stilicho to annex eastern Illyricum when the opportunity arose. In other directions, things went less fortunately. By the annihilation of the Goths, the east was left almost without an army, and the Isaurian robbers terrorized eastern Asia Minor and Syria, where they took Seleucia and even crossed to Cyprus. Arbazacius the Armenian indeed gained some successes, but he was suspected of corruption and recalled, though by the influence of the empress he escaped punishment. The chief power in the state was now Eudoxia, but there was one man who dared to oppose her, John Chrysostom. As early as 401, he offended her by complaining of some act of oppression, and not only was he constantly preaching against the prevailing luxury and dissipation among the ladies of fashion, of whom she was the leader, but he used the name Herodias and Jezebel, and in one of his sermons employed the word adoxia with an application that could not be mistaken. His popularity was so great that she would hardly have attacked him on this ground alone, but with the help of the ecclesiastical jealousy of the Bishop of Alexandria and the discontent which his high-handed proceedings in the cause of discipline aroused among some of the clergy, she procured his deposition. 
Popular clamor, however, and a building collapse in the Imperial Chamber frightened her into recalling him after a few days, and excusing herself by throwing the blame upon others. This reconciliation did not last long. Two months later, a statue of Eudoxia was erected on a spot adjoining the Church of St. Irene during divine service, and John, regarding the festivities as an insult to the Church, preached a violent sermon against those responsible for them, which the Empress took as an attack upon herself. The bishops were therefore again assembled, but the proceedings were protracted, and Arcadius, who in religious matters had something like a will of his own, was hard to move. On the 20th of June, 404, however, the bishop was finally expelled. That night, some of his fanatical partisans set fire to St. Sophia, which was destroyed with the adjoining Senate House, in which many ancient works of art perished. Less than four months afterwards, Eudoxia died from a miscarriage, and the period of active misrule from which the East had suffered since 395 came to an end. The prefecture was now entrusted to the capable hands of Anthemius, but the government still had no force to repress the incursions of the Libyan tribes or the Isurian brigands, whose raids continued to the end of the reign. The relations with the West, which had been further embittered by the affair of John Chrysostom, and, while Stilicho lived, a good understanding was impossible. After delays not easy to explain, Stilicho prepared to carry out his compact with Alaric, and, as an earnest of his intention, closed the ports against eastern ships while Alaric invaded Epirus. But, hearing that the usurper Constantine had crossed to Gaul, Stilicho again postponed his eastern expedition, and Alaric, in anger, evacuated the dominions of Arcadius and threatened Italy. At this juncture, Arcadius died, leaving a son, Theodosius, aged seven, who, since the 10th of January, 402, had been his father's colleague, and three, perhaps four, daughters. And Stilicho, thinking the time come to carry out his old project of bringing the East under his rule, proposed to send Alaric to Gaul and go himself to Constantinople as the representative of Honorius. But a hostile party secured the emperor's ear, and he was put to death. The ports were then opened and amity restored. The care of the emperor's person was in the hands of Antiochus, a eunuch with Persian connections. But the direction of affairs fell to Anthemius, whose chief advisor was the sophist Troilus, and the period of his administration was one of the most fortunate in the history of the East. The danger from the West had been removed by Stilicho's fall, and on the eastern side the best relations were maintained with Yazdegerd the Persian king, with whom a commercial treaty was made. The military power of the empire had suffered too much to be quickly restored, but we hear no more of Isaurian raids, and it was found possible to send a small force to support Honorius against Alaric. It was only, however, by a combination with subject tribes that the Huns were driven across the Danube, while their tributaries, the Skiri, were captured in vast numbers and enslaved or settled as Coloni in Asia Minor. To prevent such incursions, the fleet of the Danube was strengthened. Other salutary measures were the relief given to the taxpayers of Illyricum in the east, the restoration of the fortifications of the Illyrian cities, and the reorganization of the corn supply of Constantinople. But the work for which the name of Anthemius was most remembered is the wall built from the Propontis of the Golden Horn to enclose the portion of the city which had grown up outside the wall of Constantine, a wall which substantially exists to this day. In 414, the administration of Anthemius came to an end, probably by death, and on 4th of July, Pulchera, the daughter of Arcadius, was proclaimed Augusta, a title that had not been granted to an emperor's sister since Trajan times. And henceforth, though only two years older than Theodosius, she exercised the functions of regent, and her bust was placed in the Senate House with those of the emperors. At the same time, Antiochus was removed from the palace. The court of Pulcheria was a strange contrast to her mother's. For political rather than religious reasons, she took a vow of perpetual virginity and induced her sisters to do the same, and the princesses spent their time in spinning and devout exercises. She herself was a ready speaker and writer in Greek and Latin, and she had her brother trained in rhetoric, as well as horsemanship and the use of arms, in ceremony and deportment, and the observances of religion. Hence he grew up a strict observer of the ecclesiastical rules, a fair scholar with a special interest in natural science and medicine, a keen huntsman, an excellent penman, exemplary in private life, mild and good-tempered. But, as everything likely to make him a capable ruler was excluded from his education, the emperor remained all his life a puppet in the hands of his sister, his wife, and his eunuchs. The transference of the regency to a girl of fifteen could not be effected without a change in the methods of administration, and it is therefore not surprising to find the government accused of fiscal oppression, while the sale of offices, which was restricted under Anthemius, became again a matter of public notoriety.
in Alexandria, which, being almost equally divided between Christians, Jews, and heathens, was always turbulent, the change gave occasion for a serious outbreak. After prolonged rioting between Jews and Christians, the bishop Cyril instigated his followers to expel the Jews. This, the prefect Orestes reported to the emperor, while Cyril sent his own account, and Orestes, refusing to yield, some fanatical monks attacked and stoned him. The chief perpetrator was tortured to death, whereupon Cyril treated him as a martyr, and both parties appealed to Constantinople. It now came to be believed among Cyril's partisans that Orestes was acting under the influence of the celebrated mathematician and philosopher Hypatia, who was in constant communication with him. Accordingly, a party of Parabolani pulled her from her chariot, dragged her into the church called Caesarium, and beat or scraped her to death with tiles. At first, the government acted with some vigor. No personal punishment was inflicted, but the Parabolani were limited to 500, and the selection was made subject to the approbation of the Augustal and Praetorian prefects, while they were forbidden to appear in the council house or law courts, or at public spectacles. It was not long, however, before the influence or bribes of Cyril procured the restoration of the freedom of selection. The increase of anti-pagan feeling was also shown by a law excluding pagans from high administrative office and from the army. Other disturbances were the rebellion of Count Plintha in Palestine an attack on the city prefect Actius, and a mutiny in the east. In Armenia, Yazdegerd having appointed his brother as king, the Roman portion of the country was definitely annexed and placed under a count. It was now time for Theodosius to marry, and it was Pulcheria's object to prevent the choice of a wife with powerful connections, who would be likely to endanger her ascendancy. She had by some means made the acquaintance of Athenais, daughter of the Athenian sophist Leontius, and a woman of high education and literary ability, who had come to Constantinople through a dispute with her brothers about their father's property. As a friendless girl, dependent on herself, yet fitted by education for the part of an empress, she seemed exactly suited for the purpose. The Augusta therefore introduced her to Theodosius, who declared himself willing to make her his wife. Athenais made no objection to accepting Christianity, and was baptized under the name of Eudokia, Pulcheria standing sponsor. And on the 7th of June, 421, the marriage was celebrated. The new empress bore no malice against her brothers, but summoned them to court, where one became prefect of Illyricum, and the other master of the offices. In this, however, she perhaps showed worldly wisdom rather than Christian charity. After the birth of a daughter, she received the title of Augusta. About the time of the marriage, the peace with Persia was broken. Yazdegerd had always shown himself friendly to the Christians, but at the end of his reign the fanatical act of a bishop drove him to severe measures. Some Christians fled to Roman territory, and when their surrender was refused, the position became so critical that permission was given to the inhabitants of the exposed provinces to fortify their own lands. After Yazdegerd's violent death late in 420, a more extended persecution was begun by Warahran V, and the court of Constantinople began the war by sending the Alan Artaburius through Roman Armenia into Arezanine, where he defeated the Persian Narsai, who retreated to Nisibis. Artaburius, with numerous prisoners, advanced into Amida to prevent an invasion of Mesopotamia, and here, as the prisoners were starving, Bishop Acacius melted the church plate, ransomed them with the price, gave them provisions, and sent them home. Artaburius then besieged Nisibis, and Warafran prepared to march to its relief, while he sent Al-Mundahir, Sheikh of Alhira, to invade Syria. Many of the Arabs were, however, drowned in the Euphrates, and the rest defeated by the general Vitianus. On the king's approach, Artaburius burnt his engines and retreated, and the Persians, crossing the frontier, vainly attacked Rasena for over a month. But, though the Roman gained some successes, no decisive victory was obtained, and Theodosius thought it best to propose terms. Warahran was also inclined for peace. But, wishing to gain a success first, he ordered an attack upon a Roman force, while he kept the ambassador with him. The Romans were surprised. But during the battle, another division, under Procopius, the son-in-law of Anthemius, unexpectedly appeared, and the Persians, taken on both sides, were defeated. Warahran then took up the negotiations in earnest and on his undertaking to stop the persecution and catch each party binding itself not to receive the Arab subjects of the other, peace was made for one hundred years. This victory was celebrated by Eudokia in an epic poem. It was probably the result of the transference of troops from Europe to meet the Persians that the Huns this year invaded Thrace, though in consequence of the prudent measures of Anthemius, the Danuban frontier was rarely violated before 441. The provinces had, however, not recovered from the calamities of Arcadius's time, and constant remissions of taxation were necessary. The relations with the West were once again disturbed through the refusal of Theodosius to recognize the elevation of Constantius, 
And when after the death of Honorius, the obscure John was proclaimed emperor in prejudice of the claims of the young Valentinian, the son of Placidia, there was an open breach. When John's envoys arrived to ask for recognition, Theodosius threw them into prison. Placidia now received anew the title of Augusta, which Theodosius had before ignored. Valentinian was declared Caesar at Thessalonica. Mother and son were sent to Italy with a large army under Artaburius, his son Aspar, and Candidianus. And John, having been overthrown, Valentinian was invested with the empire. The concord between the two divisions of the empire was confirmed by the betrothal of Valentinian to Theodosius' daughter Eudoxia, and the victory celebrated by the building of the Golden Gate, through which the emperors made their formal entries into Constantinople. In 431, when Placidia needed assistance against the Vandals, an army under Aspar was sent to Africa, but Aspar returned three years later without success, probably after an understanding which made him ever after a friend of the Vandals. In 427, some Ostrogoths who had seceded from the Huns were settled in Thrace, and other tribes were received in 433, while a raid was made by the Huns and a more serious attack only prevented by abject submission to their demands. At sea, a pirate fleet entered the Propontis, but in 438, the pirate Contratus was captured. At home, stones were thrown at Theodosius in a riot after a famine in 431, and there were bitter complaints of the extortion of the eunuchs. Two matters of internal administration deserve special mention, the codification of the law and the foundation of the university at Constantinople as a counterpoise to the schools of Athens. In this university, there were 28 professors of Greek and Latin grammar and rhetoric, and two of law, but only one of philosophy, and all other public teaching in the city was forbidden. Eudokia was at first of necessity subservient to her sister-in-law, but that she would always accept the position was not to be expected. A difference appeared in the time of the Synod of Ephesius, when Pulcheria was victorious, but afterwards her influence declined, and at last a palace intrigue drove her to retire from court. Under Eudokia's patronage, a large share of the administration fell to Cyrus, an Egyptian poet and philosopher who became city prefect in 435, and in 439 combined his office with the Praetorian prefecture. Cyrus was the first prefect who published decrees in Greek, and he also distinguished himself by renovating the buildings of the city, especially by an extension of the sea wall to join the wall of Anthemius, which the capture of Carthage by the Vandals had made desirable. Antiochus, the emperor's old guardian, was restored to favor and made prepositus. End of section 55. Section 56 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 56. Chapter 16, The Eastern Provinces from Arcadius to Anastasius, by E. W. Brooks, Continued. The capture of Carthage caused the dispatch of a fleet to Sicily in 441, but in consequence of an eruption of Huns into Illyricum, the force was recalled in 442 and peace made, but not before the expedition had led to a war with Persia. Under the capable direction of Anatolius, the Magister Militum Por Orientum, the defense of the eastern frontier had been strengthened by stricter rules of discipline in the army and by the building of the fortress of Theodosiopolis in Armenia. This last, the new king, Yazdegerd II, probably considered a menace, and he therefore took advantage of the troubles in the west to begin war, crossing the frontier from Nisibus and sacking several towns, while another force raided Roman Armenia. He was, however, hampered by bad weather and threatened by the Ephthalites beyond the Caspian. Hence, though the Romans had no army to oppose him, Anatolius and Aspar, by a large sum of money and a promise to surrender some Christian refugees, persuaded him to make a truce for a year. As the troubles with the Ephthalites continued, this was followed by a definite peace on the terms that neither party should build a fort within a certain distance of the frontier, and the Romans should renew an undertaking made by Jovian to contribute to the defenses of the Caucasian gates. One of the last acts of Cyrus was to provide that the Armenian frontier lands should be held on condition of supplying horses, wagons, and pikemen for the army. After her daughter's marriage, for which Valentinian came to Constantinople, Eudokia went on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and on the way gained much popularity at Antioch by a speech in which she boasted of her Greek blood. She returned in 439, and meanwhile some hostile influence seems to have been at work, for in 440, Paulinus, ex-master of the offices, was beheaded at Caesarea in Cappadocia, on suspicion, as was popularly believed, 
of an intrigue with her, and soon afterward she was asked to leave to retire to Jerusalem, and left Constantinople forever. With her fell Cyrus, who through the popular acclamation, Constantine founded, Cyrus restored, had incurred the emperor's jealousy. Being charged with paganism, he took orders to save his head, and was made bishop of Cotieum, where four bishops were said to have been murdered. By his discreet conduct he succeeded in retaining his see till the time of Leo, when on some unknown charge he was deprived and came back to Constantinople, where he remained in possession of large property. Antiochus was also deposed and compelled to take orders. Pulcheria returned to court, but the chief influence was for the rest of the reign exercised by the eunuch Chrysaphius. Eudokia was not left in peace at Jerusalem, but Saturninus, count of the Domestici, was sent to spy upon her, and for some reason beheaded two clergymen who attended upon her. She in revenge assassinated Saturninus, and was deprived of her imperial train, though she still disposed of ample revenues, which she spent on the erection of churches and monasteries. She composed several poems, of which large portions have been lost, and died in 460. The good administration introduced by Anthemius had been in some measure maintained under the ascendancy of Pulcheria and Eudokia, but under Chrysaphius, the days of Arcadius seemed to have returned. The Huns overran Thrace and Illyricum, and the murder of the Magister Militum of Thrace, John the Vandal, apparently by order of Chrysaphius, did not strengthen the resistance. The Romans suffered a severe defeat, and Chrysaphius could only grant Attila's terms and send emissaries to assassinate him. In 447, the walls of Constantinople were shattered by an earthquake, and in consequence of the terror caused by the Huns, the prefect Constantine rebuilt them in sixty days, and the Isurians, who had renewed their raids in 441, were called in under their leader Zeno to defend the city. Zeno afterwards extorted the office of Magister Militum per Orientum, and demanded the surrender of Chrysaphius. And though this was not granted, the danger from the Huns prevented an intended campaign against the marauders. Bands of Sani, Saracens, and Caucasian Huns had invaded the empire during the Persian War, and we hear of Saracen raids again several years later, while Yazdegerd showed signs of a desire to renew hostilities. Libya too was again harassed by the frontier tribes, and the Vandals terrorized the Ionian Sea. On the 26th of July, 450, Theodosius broke his spine by a fall from his horse while hunting, and died two days later. The appointment of a successor was left to the Augusta Pulcheria, and her choice fell upon Marcion, a veteran soldier from Thrace of high character who had held the post of Domesticus, chief of the staff, to Aspar, to whose influence the selection must be ascribed. Pulcheria crowned Marcion in the presence of the Senate, and gave him her hand in nominal marriage. The first act of the new rulers was to put Chrysaphius to death. The sale of offices was prohibited, though it is unlikely that the prohibition was strictly carried out, and attempts were made to lighten the burden of taxation by a remission of arrears, by reducing the number of praetors to three, and relieving non-resident senators from the burden of office, and by enacting that the consuls, instead of squandering money on the populace, should make a contribution towards the repair of the aqueducts, an obligation which was extended to honorary consuls by the Emperor Zeno. Marcion also put an end to a system under which the possessors of certain lands which had been sold by the state in the time of Valens escaped their share of taxation. The popularity of his rule is shown by the words, Reign like Marcion, with which the citizens in 491 greeted Anastasius. In external relations, the reign was a fortunate one. As Attila was preparing for his western expedition, his demands for money could safely be refused, and when after his return he repeated them with threats, death prevented him from carrying these out. From Zeno, who was appealing to heathen support, the emperor was delivered by his death following a fall from his horse. Envoys from the Armenian insurgents had come before Theodosius' death to ask for help, but Marcion refused to break the peace with Persia. With the Vandals also, peace was maintained, for though after the sack of Rome in 455, Marcion tried to obtain the release of Eudoxia and her daughters. The possession of these hostages, as well as Aspar's influence, secured Gaiseric from attack. In Syria, the Magister Militum, Aspar's son Artaburius, was in 452 fighting with Arab raiders near Damascus, after which negotiations were begun, but with what result is not known. At the same time, Egypt was suffering from incursions of the Blemies, who gave hostages to the imperial envoy Maximin, and made peace for 100 years, but on his sudden death recovered the hostages by force and renewed their raids till put down by Florus, prefect and count of Egypt. 
A more serious position arose on the Danuban frontier, where, after the collapse of the Hun Empire, some of the Huns and other tribes were settled in the north of Illyricum and Thrace as Federati. Of these, the most important was a body of Ostrogoths, who, under three brothers of the Amal family, Walamir, Theodomir, and Widimir, settled in eastern Pannonia, of which they received a grant from Marcion, who did not recognize Valentinian III's successors. They also received pay as Federati. In 453, Pulcheria died, leaving all her property to the poor, a bequest which Marcion faithfully carried out. By a former wife, Marcion had a daughter, whom he had given in marriage to Anthemius, grandson of the prefect Anthemius. But when he died, at the age of sixty-five, he had taken no steps to secure his son-in-law's succession, and the throne lay at the disposal of Aspar the patrician and Magister Militum, who as an Arian and barbarian could not himself assume the crown, but might reign in the name of some puppet emperor. He therefore chose Leo, a military tribune from Dacia, and his own steward, a man of some capacity but little education, and the choice was ratified by the Senate. As there was no elder emperor or Augusta to perform the coronation, Leo was crowned by the patrician Anatolius. This precedent was henceforth followed whenever an emperor was not merely being associated with a senior colleague. One of the first acts of this new reign was the recognition of Majorian, after whose death Leo, though not recognizing Severus, accepted the western consuls, and, while sending an embassy to Gaiseric to secure the liberation of the widow and daughters of Valentinian, urged him to cease attacking Italy and Sicily. Gaiseric refused to make peace with the west, or to release Eudoxia, whom he married to his son, but on receiving a share of Valentinian's property, released his widow and his other daughter Placidia, who came to Constantinople. Some years later, Eudoxia escaped and ended her days at Jerusalem. Leo also induced Marcellinus, who had set up an independent power in Dalmatia, to keep peace with the Western Emperor, but further embassies to Gaiseric effected nothing. About this time, the migration of the Avars from the east caused a movement among the Hunnic tribes of the Caucasus, in consequence of which the Surigurs asked for Roman protection and obtained it, though some trouble with the fugitive peoples followed. But when the Surigurs invaded Persian territory, an embassy arrived from King Piroz to complain of the treatment of Magians in the empire and the reception of fugitives, and to ask for the stipulated contribution in money or men towards the defense of the Caucasian gates, and money for the war against the Ephthalites, to which an answer was sent through the ex-prefect Constantine that the complaints were unfounded and the contribution could not be given. Meanwhile, Gobazes, king of Lazica, had offended the government, and a campaign in his country was undertaken, the troops returning to Roman territory for the winter. The coast road was, however, so difficult that the Romans were thinking of asking leave to pass through Persian territory. Accordingly, on receiving an embassy from Gobazes, Leo granted peace on the nominal condition that he and his son should not reign conjointly, and Gobazes, having failed to obtain help from Piroz on account of the Ephthalite war, consented to retire in his son's favor. A certain Dionysus, who was known to Gobazes from previous negotiations, was at his request sent to Lazica and brought the king back with him to Constantinople, where by plausible words and the wearing of Christian emblems he obtained favor, so that his abdication was not insisted on. His submission drew upon him the enmity of Peroz, and a force under Heraclius was sent to his support. But as the Persians were occupied elsewhere and the maintenance of the troops was expensive, Gobazes sent them back. Leo was meanwhile negotiating with Peroz through Constantine, but Piroz, having overcome the Ephthalites, sent to announce the fact, and turned against Gobazes, who had meanwhile taken some forts from his northeastern neighbors, the Suani, who were in alliance with Persia. Gobazes asked that part of the Armenian frontier force might be sent to his support, but Leo, being occupied with the African expedition, refused assistance. Meanwhile, the relations between Leo and Aspar had become strained. A difference between them had arisen in 459 when Leo appointed Vivianus prefect in preference to Aspar's candidate, Tatianus, and again in 460 Leo expelled the patriarch Timothy of Alexandria in spite of Aspar's opposition. Another dispute arose over the fairs of Illyricum. The Pannonian Ostrogoths, whose subsidy had been withheld by Leo, raided Illyricum and took Dyrrachium, but were obliged to give Theodomir's son, the boy Theodoric, as a hostage before obtaining the pay which they claimed. They then turned against the neighboring tribes, and after a time became involved in a war with the Skiri. Both parties appealed to the emperor for help, and, though Aspar advised neutrality, Leo insisted on supporting the Skiri, who gained a victory, Walamir falling in the battle. The emperor was alarmed by the condition of the west, which after Majorian's death fell under the domination of Ricimer, and he determined, if possible, to save the east from a similar fate. 
But as Aspar was surrounded by a large bodyguard of Goths and other dependents and the Thracian Goths, whose chief, Theodoric, son of Triarius, was his wife's nephew, were in alliance with him, and it was necessary to raise a force from some other quarter to overthrow him. Accordingly, Leo turned his eyes towards the Isaurians, who had done so much injury to the empire in the days of Arcadius and Theodosius, but might now be used to rescue it from more dangerous enemies. His elder daughter, Ariadne, was therefore given in marriage to the Isaurian Terracicadisa, who in memory of his countrymen of the time of Theodosius took the name of Zeno, and brought with him an Isaurian bodyguard to set against that of Aspar. Meanwhile, disturbances had arisen in Thrace. From about 460, the command there was held by Ardaburius, but it was afterwards transferred to Basilicus, brother of Leo's wife, Verina. In 467, trouble arose with Attila's son, Dengizic, and a force of Huns crossed the Danube with a large body of Goths. But the two nations were surrounded by a Roman army, and induced by a trick to fight one another, so that a general slaughter followed, from which only a few escaped. In 467, Ricimer, requiring the eastern fleet for protection against the Vandals, asked Leo to nominate an emperor, whereupon he chose Marcian's son-in-law, Anthemius, and, having persuaded Marcellinus to submit to the new emperor, prepared a great expedition by land and sea. But the fleet was, by the mismanagement of Vasilisius, almost annihilated and Aspar, the Vandal's friend, was believed to have induced him to betray his trust. After his return, he took refuge in St. Sophia, but at Verena's intercession, escaped punishment. Meanwhile, Zeno was sent to Thrace, and the soldiers, instigated, as was supposed, by Aspar, tried to murder him, and he with difficulty escaped to Sardica. The command was then given to Anagast, who soon afterwards rebelled. Having been persuaded to submit, he accused Artaburius of prompting his rebellion. Zeno now strengthened the Isurians in Constantinople by introducing a band of marauders who had been driven from Rhodes, and their arrival was, on the account of the unpopularity of the Isurians, followed by a riot. He was then sent to the east as Magister Militum, and as such was compelled to remove the Isaurian robber Indicus, son of Papirius, from his hereditary stronghold of Cherus. The rise of Zeno and the strength of the Isaurians forced Aspar to act vigorously if he was not to be altogether ousted from power and he pressed Leo to make his second son, Patricius, Caesar, and give him his daughter, Leontia, in marriage. In spite of the opposition of the monks, who were horrified at the prospect of an Arian emperor, Leo thought it best to comply, and the new Caesar, for some reason, went to Alexandria, where he displayed himself with great pomp. Something more than titles was however needed to make Aspar secure, and Artaburius tried to cut the ground from under the emperor's feet by tampering with the Isaurians in Constantinople. This was revealed to Zeno, who had returned to Constantinople in the latter half of 471, and it was resolved to make an end to the supremacy of the Alans. Aspar and his two elder sons were accordingly treacherously cut down in the palace, though Patricius is said to have recovered from his wounds. The youngest son, Hermanaric, had received warning from Zeno and was not there. Some of Aspar's guards under Osteri broke into the palace, but were expelled by the Excubitores, a new force instituted by Leo, perhaps for some such purpose. They succeeded, however, in escaping, and after doing some damage in Thrace, joined Theodoric, but an attack on the city by the Goths was repulsed. Leontia was now given in marriage to Marcion, the son of Anthemius. Before the attack on Aspar, Leo had thought it desirable to gain the support of the Goths of Pannonia, and therefore released Theodoric, the Amal, who returned with great gifts to his father. His first act was to defeat the Sarmatians and recover Singidunum, which, however, he did not restore to the emperor. So, far from assisting Leo, Theodomir, now released from restraint, thought the disturbances in both divisions of the empire a good opportunity to acquire new territories. Accordingly, he sent Widemir to Italy, while he himself marched southeast and occupied Nasus. Leo thereupon sent Hilarianus, master of the offices, to offer him settlements in Lower Moesia. On these terms, peace was made, and soon afterwards Theodomir died and was succeeded by Theodoric. As Theodoric, son of Triarius, remained in arms, an ambassador was sent to ask his terms, and through his envoys whom he sent to Constantinople, he demanded Aspar's property, his post of Magister Militum, and a grant of the whole of the province of Thrace. As Leo would only agree to the second of these demands, Theodoric sent a force to Philippi, which however only burned the suburbs while he himself reduced Arcadiopolis. But as the Goths were straitened for food, he sent another embassy, and peace was made on the conditions that he was made Magister Militum and paid 2,000 pounds of gold a year and that Leo recognized him as chief of all the Thracian Goths, and did not receive deserters from them, while he undertook to assist the emperor against all enemies except the Vandals, who had been Aspar's friends. 
The reign of Leo was afterwards remembered for the law by which all legal process and all spectacles in the theater, amphitheater, and circuses were forbidden on Sundays. Similar laws had been passed by Constantine, Theodosius, and Arcadius, but had probably remained little more than dead letters. And it is unlikely that even this law, at least the latter portion, was ever fully carried out. But in spite of the increasing Christian tendency of the government and of laws to the contrary, heathens continued to hold high offices of state and enjoy the favor of the court. Prominent among these was James, the physician, philosopher, and man of letters, son of a Syrian father and Greek mother, whose medical skill made him indispensable. Isaacasius, also a Sicilian philosopher, was made quaestor. Being deprived of his post and arrested under the law which forbade the tenure of office by a heathen, he was, at the intercession of James, sent for trial before Puseus, the prefect, who was known to be in sympathy with him, and allowed to escape by submitting to baptism. The philosopher Eulogius also received a pension. One of Leo's last acts was to surrender the island of Jotaba at the northern end of the Red Sea to the Arab Amru Lachaeus. This man, coming from Persian territory, had reduced several Arab tribes and occupied the island, driving out the Roman tax collectors. He then sent the bishop of his tribe to ask for a grant of the island and the chieftainship of the tribes of the province of Palestine III. And, though this was contrary to the Treaty of 422, Leo sent for him, treated him with honor, and granted his requests. During this year, the emperor was attacked by a serious illness, which made it necessary to settle the succession. Fearing, on the account of the unpopularity of the Isaurians, to declare Zeno his successor, he made his grandson, Zeno's son Leo, a boy of five, Caesar, and later crowned him Augustus in the circus. Less than three months afterwards, he died at the age of 63, and, as it was probably known that the child was unlikely to live, he was directed by Ariadne and Verena to place the crown upon his father's head. On his death, nine months later, Zeno became sole emperor in the east. The new government began with a great success, the end of the disastrous Vandal War. One of the last acts in this war was the capture of Nicopolis by the Vandals very soon after Leo's death. And about the same time, Zeno sent Severus to treat for peace, who greatly impressed Gaiseric by refusing to accept presents for himself and saying that the most acceptable present would be the release of the captives, whereupon the king gave him all the captives belonging to himself and his sons and allowed him to ransom as many more as he could. Shortly afterwards, a perpetual peace was made, which after Gaiseric's death was confirmed by his son. The Vandal danger was at an end. The peace was the more necessary on account of the disturbances in other quarters. The Arabs were making one of their raids in Syria, the Bulgarians appeared for the first time south of the Danube, and the accession of the Isaurian led to a serious rising of the Thracian Goths, who took prisoner Heraclius, the Magister Militum of Thrace, and held him to ransom. Zeno levied the sum from the general's kinsmen and sent it to the Goths, but after receiving it they killed their captive. Ilus, one of the many Isaurians who came to Constantinople after Zeno's ascension, a man whose large native following and influence with his countrymen made him a power in the state, was now appointed to the command and succeeded in holding the Goths in check. But the favor with which these Isaurian adventurers were received increased the emperor's unpopularity, and his son's death was soon followed by a plot. Verena's brother Vasilesius, who was living in retirement at Heraclea, opened negotiations with Elus, and no doubt by large promises induced him to betray his patron, and Verena joined the conspiracy which the son of Triarius also supported. Verena frightened Zeno into escaping by night with his wife and mother, and fleeing to Isauria, and the conspirators gained possession of the city without fighting. The empress had been led to believe that she would be allowed to raise Patricius, master of the offices, to the throne which she intended to share as his wife, but Vasilesius did not intend to act for anyone but himself, and, having the strongest support, was proclaimed emperor the proclamation being followed by a massacre of Isaurians. Patricius was put to death, and Verena tried to get up a conspiracy for Zeno's restoration. This being discovered, she fled to St. Sophia, but her nephew, Armatus, conveyed her away and kept her in safety till Zeno's return. Meanwhile, Ilus and his brother Trocundes were sent against Zeno, blockaded him in Spiti, and captured his brother Longinus. But soon things turned again in his favor, in the first place, Vasilesius had offended Theodoric by transferring the post of Magister Militum to his own nephew Armatus, a man of fashion who posed as a soldier and was supported by the favor of the Empress Zenonius. And in the second place, he favored the Monophysites, and, not content with abrogating the theological decree of Chalcedon, was induced by Timothy of Alexandria to abolish the Patriarchate of Constantinople created by that synod, thereby making a bitter enemy of the bishop Akakius, 
a man who cared little about theology but knew well how to stir up popular fanaticism. So threatening was the aspect of affairs that Vasilesius recalled his decrees, but it was too late. Illus and Trecundes went over to Zeno, and the combined forces marched on Constantinople, while Trecundes, with some Isaurian guards, was sent to Antioch. Armatus marched to Nicaea to oppose Zeno's advance, but he had no mind to fight in a losing cause, and on receiving the promise of the office of Magister Militum for life and the rank of Caesar for his son, Vasilesius, left the road open. And as Theodoric held aloof, Zeno entered Constantinople without opposition. Vasilesius and his family fled to St. Sophia, but they were handed over to some of his enemies, who took them to Cappadocia and beheaded them all. The promise to Armatus was kept, but as he was entering the circus, where Zeno and the young Caesar were watching the games, he was assassinated by Onulf, a man who had received great kindness from him and been raised by his influence to the military command of Illyricum. His son was ordained a reader and afterwards became bishop of Cyzicus. Theodoric the Amal, who from rivalry with his namesake had supported Zeno, was made Magister Militum and adopted in Teutonic fashion as Zeno's son-in-arms. It was perhaps these commotions which enabled the Samaritans to set up as emperor the robber Justassa, who took Caesarea, but was defeated and killed by the Duke of Palestine. Leo left the treasury full, and at the beginning of Zeno's reign the burdens were considerably lightened by the prefect Eurythrius. But, as the sum wanted for Isurian favorites could not be raised without extortion, he resigned, and his successor Sebastian earned a bad reputation by selling offices to the highest bidder. His administration was, however, distinguished by an act providing that all civil and military governors should remain in their district for fifty days after termination of office, in order that anyone with a grievance might prefer an accusation against them. One of Zeno's first tasks after his return was to decide what policy to follow with regard to the affairs of the West. The concord between the courts had been broken by the murder of Anthemius, but Leo, shortly before his death, nominated as emperor Nepos, the nephew and successor of Marcellinus, and gave him Verena's niece in marriage. The friction of the unity of the empire was, however, in part abandoned since Nepos' name does not appear in Eastern laws. After his expulsion and the dethronement of his successor, the Roman Senate asked Zeno to grant Odovacar the title of patrician, and Nepos begged for help to recover his throne. Zeno advised Adovacar to apply to Nepos for the title, but styled him patrician in a letter while declining to help Nepos. The son of Triarius, wishing to obtain pay for his men, sought to make his peace. But the senate, to which Zeno referred the matter, said they could not pay both Theodorics and left it to him to choose between them. Zeno then made a violent speech to the army against the son of Triarius. He did not, however, immediately break with him, but protracted negotiations. At last, finding that his strength was increasing while that of his rival was diminishing, he summoned troops from all quarters and announced the appointment of Elus to the command, which was, however, probably because of his growing jealousy of Elus, transferred to Martinianus. As this change led to disorder among the Isaurian soldiery, Zeno summoned the Amal to his aid, promising that, if he would take the field, Martinianus should meet him at the passes of Mount Hamus and another force at the Hebrus, and on this understanding Theodoric set out. But either from treachery or from lack of discipline, no army met him, and his Roman guides led him to a place where he found the heights in front occupied by his rival, who then easily persuaded him to make common cause against the emperor. Both sent to Constantinople to state their terms, the Amal demanding land and provisions for his men and the emoluments of his office, and the son of Triarius the terms granted by Leo with the arrears of pay and the restoration of any living members of Aspar's family. Zeno promised the former, in case of victory, a large sum down, a yearly pension, and the hand of Valentinian's granddaughter Juliana, or any other lady whom he might name, and, this offer being refused, announced that he would lead the army himself. But circumstances now caused a change of plan. The part played by Elus in 475, together with his retention of Longinus as a hostage and his influence with the Isaurian soldiers, made him something of a thorn in Zeno's side and the jealous ambition of Verena rendered her his deadly enemy. In the summer of 477, Paul, one of the emperor's slaves, tried to assassinate him and was surrendered for punishment. In 478, another attempt was made by an Alan, who under torture confessed that he had been instigated by Epinicus the prefect, a client of Urbicius, the eunuch chamberlain and favored by Verena. Zeno thereupon surrendered Epinicus also to Elus, who sent him to Isauria, and then, having obtained leave on the ground of the death of a brother, withdrew to his native country. Fearing a rebellion on the part of Elus, 
Zeno now resolved to secure the support of the son of Triarius and renounced his intention of taking the field. And as this caused disaffection in the army, he, on Martinianus's advice, recalled it to winter quarters. Peace was then made. The son of Triarius was to receive food and pay for 13,000 men, the command of two regiments of Scolarii, the office of Magister Militum, and the property that had been taken from him, while any surviving members of the Aspar family were to retain their property and live in any city that Zeno might choose. End of section 56. Section 57 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 57. Chapter 16. The Eastern Provinces from Arcadius to Anastasius by E. W. Brooks. Continued. The imperial troops succeeded in expelling the Amal from Thrace but Macedonia was left to his mercy. He sacked Stobi, and on his approaching Thessalonica, the citizens, thinking themselves betrayed, transferred the keys from the prefect to the bishop. Heraclea he was at first persuaded by large gifts to spare, but on the refusal of a demand for corn and wine, burnt the greater part of it. He was repulsed from Lycnidus, but took Scampia, which was deserted, and occupied Dyrrachium, which a confederate had induced the garrison by a trick to abandon. Meanwhile, Zeno had again opened negotiations, and the patrician Adamantius, the son of Vivianus, was sent to treat. At Thessalonica, he put down a military tumult directed against the prefect, and at Edessa handed to Sabinianus the emperor's commission as magister militum of Illyricum in place of Onulf. From Lycnidus, he invited Theodoric either to come to Lycnidus or to send hostages for his own safety if he went to Dyrrachium. As Sabinianus, who accompanied him, refused to secure the return of the hostages by oath, this plan failed. But Adamantius went with a small escort to a wild spot near Dyrrachium and invited Theodoric to meet him. Theodoric came and stood on the opposite bank of a river, and Adamantius offered him a settlement in the district of Potalia in Dardania, where he would act as a check on his namesake and be between the Thracian and Illyrian armies. Theodoric refused to move before spring, but offered, if supported by a Roman army, to destroy the Thracian Goths on condition that he might then be made Magister Militum and live in Constantinople, or, if preferred, to go to Dalmatia and restore Nepos. Adamantius, however, declined to make terms until he left Epirus. Meanwhile, Sabinianus, having received reinforcements, captured 5,000 Goths, and Zeno was encouraged to break off negotiations. For the next two years, Sabinianus held the Goths in check. On the 25th of September, 479, the walls of Constantinople were greatly damaged by an earthquake. Zeno, in fear of the Goths, begged Ilus to return in order that his Isaurians might assist in defending the city. And the emperor and the chief officials came out beyond Chalcedon to meet him. Having learned from Apinicus that Verina was the author of the plot against his life, Ilus refused to enter Constantinople unless she was surrendered, and Zeno, who was clearly in fear of him and perhaps not sorry to be rid of his mother-in-law, complied. She was conveyed by Ilus' brother-in-law, Matronianus, to Tarsus, where she was compelled to become a deaconess and kept in custody at the Isaurian Delisandus. Ilus was made master of the offices, Apinicus was at his request recalled, and his client, Pamprepius, the philosopher, who had been expelled on account of his open paganism and the suspicion of inciting his patron to treason, returned with him and was made quaestor. The predominance of Ilus soon led to a vigorous attempt to throw off the Isaurian rule. On the pretext of Verena's banishment, Marcian, the son-in-law of Leo, having secured the adhesion of the son of Triarius and the support of a force of barbarians and a large number of citizens, rose against Zeno and claimed the crown for himself on the ground that Leontia was born in the purple while Ariadne was born before Leo's ascension. During the day of the insurgents, aided by the people who hurled missiles from the houses at the soldiers, carried all before them, but in the night, Ilus brought some Isaurians over from Chalcedon, and on the next day the rising was suppressed, though Ilus' house was burnt. Marcion, who fled to the Church of the Apostles, was compelled to take orders and sent to Caesarea in Cappadocia, while his brothers, Procopius and Romulus, escaped to Theodoric's camp, and Leontia sought refuge in a convent. Marcion, however, escaped, and with a rustic force attacked in Cairo, but was captured by Trocundes and confined in the castle of Cheris, whither his wife and daughters were now brought to join him. 
Immediately after the rising, Theodoric, the son of Triarius, appeared before Constantinople under pretense of assisting the emperor, thinking that, as the towers and battlements had been overthrown by the earthquake, he could easily take it. But, finding the Isaurians manning the wall and ready to burn the city in case of defeat, he accepted Zeno's gifts and promises and withdrew. He refused, however, to surrender the fugitives, and was thereupon superseded in the office of Magister Militum by Trocundes. He then plundered Thrace, and Zeno could only call in the Bulgarians against him. Having defeated the Bulgarians, Theodoric again appeared before the capital, but finding the gates strongly guarded by Elus and his Isaurians, tried to cross to Bithynia and was defeated at sea. Receiving news of a conspiracy against him, he returned home and put the conspirators to death, after which he marched towards Greece to seek new territory, and on the way was accidentally killed. His son, Rekatak, who by killing his uncles became sole ruler of his people, returned to Thrace and continued to ravage the country. In 481, Sabinianus died a violent death, some said, by Zeno's contrivance, and Theodoric, the Amal, plundered Macedonia and Thessaly and sacked Larissa. John the Scythian and Moschianus were sent against him, but no great success was obtained. In consequence of the threatened revolt of Elus, Theodoric was invited to Constantinople, made patrician and magister militum, and designated consul, and received territory in Dacia and Lower Moesia. His rival, Rikitak, who was in the city at the same time, he was allowed to assassinate, and the Thracian Goths ceased to maintain a separate existence. Ariadne, urged by her mother, pressed Zeno to recall Verena, but he referred her to Elus, who refused compliance. A third attempt upon the life of Elus was then made by a Scalarian, who succeeded in cutting off his ear while he was going to palace to receive some barbarian envoys at the emperor's request. The assassin was put to death, and Zeno denied on oath all knowledge of the matter. But Elus, feeling himself unsafe, asked for leave of absence on the ground of needing change of air. Zeno then made him magister militum par orientum with the right of appointing dukes, and, taking with him Matronianus, Marsus, who had commanded the land force in the expedition against the Vandals, Pamprepius, and other powerful men, and a large military force, he withdrew to Antioch, where he set himself to gain popularity by largesses and lavish expenditure on public buildings. The patrician Leontius, who was sent to ask for Verena's release, was induced to remain. That a civil war was imminent must have been clear to both parties, and after the accommodation with Theodoric, Zeno demanded the surrender of Longinus, and on receiving a refusal, sent John the Scythian to supersede Elus, expelled his friends, and confiscated their property, which he gave to the Isaurian cities. Elus now openly revolted, proclaimed Marcian emperor, and sent envoys to Adoacros, who refused assistance, and to the Persians and the satraps of the five provinces annexed in 298, who promised support to any force that appeared in their neighborhood. It is clear that he did not intend to head a mere Isaurian revolt, which could not have any lasting success, but to form a powerful combination against the emperor, for which purpose he held out hopes to the heathens through Pamprepius, while he was also on friendly terms with the Chalcedonians, who had been offended by the issue of the Henetacon, whereby Zeno soon after his departure tried to placate the Monophysites. At first, to prevent a revolt in Isuria, Zeno sent a small force under Elus' bastard brother, Linges, and the Isurian Conan, who had exchanged a military life for the bishopric of Apamea. Whereupon Elus, for some reason, dropped Marcian and brought Verena, who as Augusta might advance some claim to appoint an emperor, to Tarsus, where she formally crowned Leontius, who eight days later entered Antioch. The inhabitants of Chalcis refused to accept the new emperor's busts, and he attacked the city for forty-five days, while at Edessa the citizens shut the gates against Metronianus. About the same time, the great victory of the Ephthalites precluded all hope of support from Persia. Theodoric was now sent with a force of Romans and Goths to join John the Scythian, but Zeno changed his mind and recalled him, though his Goths remained with the army. And in his place, Hermanric, the son of Aspar, who had once revealed a conspiracy to Zeno and had married a daughter of his illegitimate son, was sent with a contingent of Rugians. When the force which Elus sent against the imperial army was defeated, he hastily summoned Leontius from Antioch, and they fled to the stronghold of Cheris, to which Verena had already been sent. His confederates then shut themselves up in different fortresses, and many of his men deserted. Zeno recalled the Goths who were no longer needed and made the Isaurian Cotomenes Magister Militum in place of Theodoric, while another Isaurian, Longinus of Cardala, was made master of the offices. Nine days after the beginning of the siege, Verena died, and a month later, Marsus, and Elus left the defense to the owner of the fortress, Indicus, Trocundi's brother-in-law. Trocundes, who had been sent to collect reinforcements, was captured by John and beheaded, and Zeno's brother Longinus was allowed to escape. 
Theodoric had perhaps been occupied during 485 by a Bulgarian invasion, but in 486 he raided Thrace, and Odoacros, in spite of his previous refusal, showed signs of wishing to assist Ilus, who now in vain made proposals for peace, while Zeno stirred up the Rugians against Odoacros. In 487, Theodoric advanced close to Constantinople, and an agreement was made under which he set out to wrest Italy from Odoacros, who had defeated the Rugians, and the east was rid of the Goths forever. All hope for the besieged was now at an end. Pemprepius, who had prophesied success, was put to death, and at last Indicus and others betrayed the fort. Ilus' requests with regard to the burial of his daughter, who had died during the siege, and the treatment of his family were granted, and he and Leontius were beheaded, and their heads exposed at Constantinople. The traitors were all killed during the assault, perhaps by the besieged. Verena's body was taken to Constantinople and buried with Leos. Most of the Isaurian fortresses were dismantled, as the satraps of the five provinces had been in communication with Ilus, the hereditary tenure of the four most important satrapies was abolished, though the satraps retained their native forces. Zeno had by his first wife a son, Zeno, but he had killed himself by his excesses at an early age, and the emperor wished to leave the crown to his brother Longinus. The infamous character of Longinus and the unpopularity of the Isaurians hindered him from declaring him Caesar, but he appointed him Magister Militum in the hopes that his military authority and the strength of the Isaurians in the army would secure him the succession. On the 9th of April, 491, Zeno died of dysentery at the age of 60. In accordance with the precedent of 450, the choice of a successor was left to the Augusta Ariadne, and on the next morning, by the advice of Urbicius, she nominated the Salentieri Anastasius of Duracium, a man of 61, who had shortly before been one of the three candidates selected for the See of Antioch. He was crowned the next day, and when he appeared before the people, they greeted him with the acclamation, Reign as you have lived. On the 20th of May, he married Ariadne. The new emperor began by the popular measures of remitting arrears of taxation and refusing facilities to informers, and he is credited with abolishing the sale of offices, but his reign was constantly disturbed by serious outbreaks. No immediate opposition was offered to his elevation, but in Isuria, a revolt on a small scale broke out, and at Constantinople, some unpopular action on the part of Julian, the city prefect, led to an uproar. And on an attempt to restore order by force, the rioters threw down the pedestals on which stood the busts of the emperor and empress, in front of the circus, and many were killed by the soldiers. To avoid more bloodshed, Anastasius deposed Julian, who had been appointed by Ariadne on the day of Zeno's death, and named his own brother-in-law, Secundinus, to succeed him. Thinking that peace was impossible while the Usurians were in the city, he expelled them and deprived them of the pay assigned by Zeno. Longinus, the brother of Zeno, was compelled to take orders and exile to the Thebaid, where he died, it is said, of hunger, eight years later, while his wife and daughter retired to Bithynia and lived the rest of their life on charity. The property of the late emperor, even his imperial robes, was sold by auction, and the castle of Cheris, which had not yet been occupied by the rebels, was dismantled. Longinus of Cardala and a certain Athenodorus, who were among those who had been expelled from the capital, joined the insurgents in Isauria, among whom were now to be found Linginanes, a count of Isauria, Conan the ex-bishop, and another Athenodorus. Reinforced by discontented Romans and others who served under compulsion, they advanced to Cotieum. Here John the Scythian and John the Hunchback, who had succeeded Longinus as Magister Militum in Presenti, met and defeated them. Linginanes fell in battle and the Isaurians fled to their native mountains, but the generals waited until spring before crossing the Taurus. In 493, Diogenes, a kinsman of Ariadne, took Claudiopolis, but was besieged in it by the Isaurians, and his men were nearly starved. John the Hunchback, however, forced the passes, and by a sudden attack, aided by a sortie on the part of Diogenes, routed the enemy, Bishop Conan being mortally wounded. The Isaurians were henceforth confined in their strongholds, and a certain Longinus of Salinas, who resided in the strong coast town of Antioch and had a large fleet, supplied them with provisions by sea. The emperor's attention was now distracted by an incursion of barbarians, perhaps Slavs, in Thrace, during which Julian, the magister militum of Thrace, was killed. Moreover, as his Monophysite opinions made his rule distasteful to the Chalcedonians, who were strong in Constantinople, there was perhaps communication between them and the insurgents, a charge on which the patriarch Euphemius was deprived in 495. At last, in 497, Longinus of Cardala and Athenodorus were taken and beheaded by John the Scythian, and their heads sent to Constantinople, 
while the head of the other Athenodorus, who was captured the same year, was exhibited at the gates of Tarsus. Longinus of Salinus held out till 498, and was then made prisoner by Priscus, an officer serving under John the Hunchback, exhibited in chains at Constantinople, and tortured to death at Nicaea. Large numbers of Isaurians were settled in Thrace, and the population of Isauria, which had been greatly thinned by the two wars, was thereby yet further reduced, so that the necessity which had made the mountaineers the terror of Asia Minor no longer existed. The Isaurians had done their work of saving the East from the fate of the West, and, though they still provided useful recruits for the army, their day of political power was over. The importance of looking at home for soldiers instead of trusting to the barbarians had been learned and was never forgotten. Besides the Isaurian War, Anastasius had also been troubled by incursions of Blemies in Egypt, and in 498 the bands of Saracens invaded the eastern provinces. The followers of Numan of Alhira, who owed allegiance to Persia, were after an inroad into Euphratesia, defeated by Eugenius, a duke stationed at Melitene, and parties of Tahlibi and Ghassani Arabs under Hugur and Gabala, the latter at least a Roman subject, were routed by Romanus, Duke of Palestine, who also recovered Jutaba, which was leased to a company of Roman traders for a yearly tribute. In 502, a more successful raid was made by Hugir's brother, Mahdi Kherb, but in the outbreak of the Persian War made it possible to turn the raids in another direction, and peace was made with the Tahlibi chief, Al-Harith, father of Mahdi Kherb. In 502, the Tsani also raided Pontus. Immediately after the ascension of Anastasius, Kawad, who became king of Persia in 488, demanded a contribution towards the defenses of the Caucasian gates. This was refused, but the Armenian rising prevented further action, though Anastasius refused to aid the insurgents. Kawad took advantage of the Isurian troubles to repeat his demand, but was soon afterwards deposed. Having been restored by the king of the Ephthalites under a promise of paying a large sum of money, he again applied to Anastasius for help. The emperor would only agree to lend the money on a written promise of payment, and Kawad, refusing this, entered Roman Armenia and took and sacked Theodosiopolis, which was surrendered by the treachery of Constantine, the Count of Armenia, who went over to the Persian service. Having occupied Martyropolis, he passed on to Amida, where, though there was no military force in Mesopotamia except the garrison of Constantina, a stubborn defense was made by the citizens. Anastasius sent Rufinus to offer him money to withdraw, but he kept the ambassador in custody. A Persian force, accompanied by Arabs and Ephthalites, was sent to the district of Constantina, and, after a small party had been cut to pieces, routed Eugenius of Melitene and Olympius, Duke of Mesopotamia, while Numan's Arabs plundered the territory of Carhe and advanced to Edessa. Eugenius, however, retook Theodosiopolis. Meanwhile, Kawad, despairing of taking Amida, was willing to retire for a small sum, but the governor and the magistrates refused this and demanded compensation for the crops that had been destroyed. The siege, therefore, continued, until a dark night the Persians found access by some aqueducts to a part of the wall which was guarded by some monks who were in a drunken sleep. They thereupon scaled the wall, and after hard fighting made themselves masters of the town, which for three days was given up to massacre. Rufinus was then released, and Kawad, at the beginning of spring, retreated to the neighborhood of Singara, leaving 3,000 men under Glan in Amida. Further demands for money were rejected by Anastasius, who, having immediately after the fall of Amida sent men to defend the fortified places, now dispatched a considerable army from Thrace to Mesopotamia under Patricius, Magister Militum in Presenti, Areobindus, Magister Militum per Orientum, great-grandson of Aspar, and his own nephew Hypatius, accompanied by Appion the prefect, who took up his quarters at Edessa to look after the commissariat. Patricius and Hypatius laid siege to Amida, while Areobindus encamped near Dara to stop a new invasion, and for some time prevented an advance on the part of the Persians from Singara, and even drove them in confusion to Nisibis. But when the enemy, reinforced by Arabs and Ephthalites, prepared to attack him in greater strength under the traitor Constantine, he retreated to Haram near Mardin, to be near his colleagues. His request for assistance being however disregarded, he was compelled to abandon his camp and flee to Constantina and Edessa. Patricius and Hypatius, on hearing of Areobindus' flight, raised the siege of Amida and met the Persians under Kawad himself at the neighboring fort of Apadna, but were routed and fled to Samosata. Hypatius was then recalled. Kawad's attempts to take Constantina, Edessa, and Carhe by assault were unsuccessful, and Patriciolus, who was bringing reinforcements, destroyed a small Persian force at the Euphrates, while the Persian Arabs, having ravaged the country up to the river near Batanae, crossed into Syria. A second attempt upon Edessa fared no better than the first, and Kawad then advanced to the Euphrates. 
Anastasius now sent Seller, the master of offices with large reinforcements, and though he had hitherto followed a civil career and was not formally appointed to the chief command, his personal position gave him practical authority over the other generals and replaced division by unity. On his approach, Coad marched down the river to Callinicus, where a detachment was cut to pieces by Timostratus, Duke of Acerhone. Hearing of an invasion of Caucasian Huns, Kawad then returned home, upon which Patricius, who was sent wintering at Melitene, returned to Amida and routed a force sent against him by Kawad. Seller and afterwards Areobindus then joined Patricius before Amida, where Glan had been captured by a stratagem and put to death. Seeing how things were going, Constantine returned to his allegiance and was allowed to take orders and live at Nicaea. Adid the Arab and Mushel the Armenian also went over to the Romans. The whole army was now no longer needed at Amida. Accordingly, Reabindus raided Persian Armenia, while Seller crossed into Arzanine, where he cut some cavalry to pieces and burnt the villages, killing the men and taking the women and children prisoners. Similar raids were made by the Roman Arabs. Kawad then sent his spapat, commander-in-chief, to Seller to propose peace, returning the most important prisoners. Seller at first refused terms in hopes of taking Amida, and an attempt to revictual it failed. But during the winter, which was a severe one, there were many desertions in the army, and he agreed to pay a sum of money for the surrender of the town, a definite peace being postponed till the emperor's pleasure should be known. Hostilities were, however, considered to be ended, and some Arab sheiks on the Persian side who had raided Roman territory were put to death by the Persian Marsban, and some sheiks of the Roman Arabs who had raided Persian territory were treated in the same way by Seller, who after a visit to Constantinople had returned to Syria. Anastasius granted remissions of taxes throughout Mesopotamia, gave largesses to the districts which had suffered most, restored the fortifications, and built a new fortified position on the frontier at Dara. As this was contrary to the Treaty of 442, the Persians tried to prevent it, but Kawad, being engaged in a war with the Huns and the Tamure, a tribe of unknown geographical position, was unable to take active steps in the matter. In April 506, Seller came to Edessa on his way to meet the Spapat, but upon hearing from Persian envoys of his death, he waited till a successor should be appointed. While his Gothic soldiers caused much trouble to the citizens, he then went to Dara and made peace for seven years with the new Spapat, the emperor agreeing to pay compensation for the breach of faith involved in the fortification at Dara. In Thrace and Illyricum, the departure of the Goths left the way open to the more savage Bulgarians. In 499, they inflicted a disastrous defeat on Aristus, Magister Militum of Illyricum, at the Tzerta and in 500 Anastasius thought it was wise to give a donative to the Illyrian army. At an unknown date his nephew Pompeius was defeated by some enemy at Hadrianople, and in 507 the long wall across the peninsula on which Constantinople stands was built to secure the city from attack by land. In 512 the Haruli, after their defeat by the Lombards, were settled in the empire, but afterwards rebelled and had to be put down by force of arms. In 517, the Slavs plundered Macedonia, Thessaly, and Epirus, and carried off captives whom Anastasius ransomed. Libya also suffered from the incursions of the Mazakis. Though there was little serious hostility with the Goths, relations were, for a large part of the reign, unfriendly. In 493, the emperor refused Theodoric's request for confirmation of his title to Italy, though by accepting his consuls he tacitly recognized him. In 498, however, he gave the desired recognition and returned the imperial insignia which Adokros had sent to Zeno. But in 505, a conflict was brought about by a certain Mundo, who had been expelled by the king of the Gepids and received as a federatus in the empire, but afterwards became a captain of robbers and being attacked by Sabinianus, Magister Militum of Illyricum, son of the Sabinianus who held the same office under Zeno, with Bulgarian allies, called in a Gothic force which had been fighting the Gepids. In the battle which followed at Horea Margi, the Romans were routed, but no further fighting seems to have taken place, and Mundo entered Theodoric's service. The assistance given to Mundo caused an ill feeling at Constantinople, and in 508 a fleet raided the coast of Italy, by which Theodoric was hindered from supporting the Visigoths against the Frankish king, on whom Anastasius confirmed the insignia of consulship. Shortly afterwards, peace was restored, no doubt by concessions on the side of Theodoric, who wished to be free to deal with the Franks. The domestic administration of Anastasius was distinguished by several popular measures. The most celebrated of these was the abolition of the Trisagiron, a tax on all kinds of stock and plant and trade instituted by Constantine, which pressed heavily on the poorest classes. Instead of this, he imposed a land tax called Trisatileia, which he applied to the support of the army, abolishing the rights of requisition. He also attempted, by several enactments, to ensure that soldiers received their full pay, 
But his chief financial reform was the abolition, by the advice of the Syrian Marinus, of the system under which the Curiales were responsible for the taxes of the municipalities and the institution of the tax collectors called Vindices. The burdens of the Curiales were not, however, wholly removed, for they existed in some form under Justinian. These measures were no doubt primarily intended to increase the revenue, and at the end of his reign, under the administration of Marinus, complaints were made of heavy extortion. But the immediate financial success of the policy is proved by the fact that at the time of his death the treasury was full. His humanity was shown by the abolition of fights between men and beasts, but this did not extend to the practice of exposing criminals to beasts, which existed as late as the time of Maurice. But although Anastasius is almost universally praised for his mildness and good administration, his monophysite opinions were distasteful to the population of the capital, and the peace was constantly disturbed by serious riots. In 493, his refusal to release some stone throwers of the Green faction who had been arrested by the city prefect produced an outbreak during which a stone was thrown at the emperor, part of the circus buildings burnt, and the statues of Anastasius and Ariadne dragged through the streets. Many of the rioters were arrested and punished, and the thrower of the stone, a Moor, was killed by the excubitores. But the emperor was compelled to appoint a new prefect in the person of Plato. An occasion for rioting was also provided by the ancient pagan festival of the Brite, which was celebrated by dancing performances every May. Such a riot occurred in the prefecture of Constantine, when the Greens attacked the Blues in the theater and many were killed, among them an illegitimate son of Anastasius. After this, an order was issued that the celebration of the Brite should cease throughout the empire. In 512, the Monophysite edition of the Trisagion, made at the instigation of Marinus, caused the most dangerous outbreak of the reign. The rioters killed the Monophysite monks, threw down the emperor's statues, and proclaimed emperor the unwilling Reobindus, whose wife Juliana represented the Theodosian house. When Seller and Patricius were sent to appease them, they drove them away with stones, burnt the houses of Marinus and Pompeius, and plundered Marinus' property. On the third day, Anastasius showed himself in the circus without his crown, and begged them to refrain from massacre, whereupon they demanded that Marinus and Plato should be thrown to the beasts. But the emperor, by promising concessions, persuaded them to disperse. The banishment of Ariadne's kinsman Diogenes and the ex-prefect Appian may, as they were recalled by Justin, have been caused by religious troubles. In Alexandria and Antioch, also riots were frequent. In 513, the religious differences culminated in an armed rising. The military administration of Hypatius, not the emperor's nephew, had caused discontent in the Thracian army, especially among the Bulgarian federati. These federati were commanded by Vitellianus, son of the Patriciolus who had held a command in the Persian War, who had a grievance on account of the expulsion of the patriarch Flavianus of Antioch, with whom he was on terms of close friendship. Making use of the discontent in the army, he murdered two of the general's staff, bribed the Duke of Moesia, and, having seized Carinus, one of the chief confidants of Hypatius, forced him to place the town of Odessus in his hands. By means of the money there found, he collected a large force of soldiers and rustics, and, with the cry of justice for the banished patriarch and abolition of the addition of the Trisagion, marched on Constantinople, whither Hypatius fled. Anastasius, having no army at hand, could only provide for the defense, while he set up crosses on the gates and announced the remission of one-fourth of the animal tax in Asia and Bithynia. Patricius, the magister militum, to whom Vitellianus, a large measure, owed his promotion, was sent to confer with him, and next day some of Vitellianus's chief officers entered the city, who on receiving a promise that just grievances should be remedied and the Pope asked to send representatives to settle the religious differences, took the oath of allegiance, returned to Vitellianus, and compelled him to withdraw. Cyril, a man of some capacity, was now appointed to succeed Hypatius, and, having entered Odessus from which Vitellianus had retired, was believed to be planning an attack on him. Hearing of this, Vitellianus made his way into the town by night, surprised Cyril while asleep in his house, and killed him. He was thereupon declared a public enemy by the decree of the Senate, and a large force collected and sent against him under Hypatius, the emperor's nephew, though the office of Magister Militum of Thrace was given to the barbarian Alathar. Hypatius fought for some time with varying success, and gained at least one victory. Finally, he encamped at Acris on the coast, where, being attacked by the enemy and routed, he was captured in the sea into which he had fled. Alathar was also captured and was ransomed by Vitellianus himself from the Bulgarians, whom he permitted to sell the prisoners. Vitellianus occupied all the fortresses in Scythia and Moesia, among them Sisopolis, in which he captured some envoys sent with a ransom for Hypatius. It is now expected that he would be proclaimed emperor, 
and further rioting occurred at Constantinople, in which the prefect of the watch was killed. Meanwhile, he advanced on the capital by land and sea, but on receiving 5,000 pounds of gold, the Thracian command, and a promise of satisfaction upon the religious question, he again retired, and released Hypatius, though he refused to disband his army. It was clear that neither party was likely to observe the peace, and in 515 Vitellianus, having probably promises of support from inside the city, where another riot had occurred, again appeared before Constantinople, but was defeated by land and sea, and retired to Anchialus, though still remaining at the head of his barbarian force. Hypatius was sent to the east as Magister Militum, and in July 517 went on an embassy to Persia. On the 9th of July, 518, Anastasius died suddenly, Ariadne having died three years before. End of section 57. End of chapter 16, The Eastern Provinces from Arcadius to Anastasius. Section 58 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 58. Chapter 17, Religious Disunion in the 5th Century, by Alice Gardner, Lecture of Newnham College, Cambridge. The importance of the religious controversies of the 5th century must strike the most casual reader of history, but when we approach the subject closely, we find it a tangled skein. Questions of dogmatic theology and of ecclesiastical authority are intermingled with the conflict of national ideals and the lowering of strife of personal rivalries. Only later are the lines of separation seen to indicate ancient ethnic differences. Nor does this century, more than any other century, form for our purpose one connected and distinct whole. The antagonistic forces had been gathering to a head during the preceding period, and they had to fight the battle out in the days that came after. Nevertheless, it is possible within limits to distinguish the more important of the elements making for ecclesiastical disunion, and also to mark the chief acts of the drama that fall within the limits assigned. First, then, we have to do with the opposition of two rival schools of thought, those of Alexandria and of Antioch, the homes of allegorical and of literal interpretation respectively. Next we have the emphatic assertion of authority and rejection of external interference by the great seas which before the end of our period have obtained the title and status of patriarchates. So far we seem to be concerned with forces already known in the Arian controversy, but in both respects there is a difference. The dogmatic difference between Alexandria and Antioch was, in the 5th century, quite unlike that of Athanasius and Arius in the 4th, though the theologian may discern hidden affinities in the parties severally concerned. The disputants on both sides in the controversies we are to consider were equally ready to accept the creed of Nicaea, and indeed to accuse their opponents of want of loyalty to that symbol and with regard to spheres of authority, a new complication had arisen. At Nicaea, 325, the rights of the great seas of Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch had been maintained. Byzantium counted for nothing. In fact, authorities differ on the question who was bishop at that time, and whether he attended the council in person or by deputy. But at the Second Council, that of Constantinople in 381, besides a strict injunction against the intervention of bishops in places beyond their jurisdiction, there was an assertion of the prerogative of the Bishop of Constantinople next after the Bishop of Rome, because Constantinople is New Rome. The last clause asserted an important principle that might easily lead to Caesaro papacy, for the other great sees were supposed to hold their high position in virtue of apostolic tradition, not out of coincidence with secular dominion. Constantinople might, and did, discover that it too had an apostle for its patron, namely St. Andrew. But St. Andrew's claims were vague and the imperial authority and court influence were pressing. 
the decision was but doubtfully accepted in the East, and the distinction, if allowed at all, was taken as purely honorary. In Rome it was never received at all. We cannot wonder that the bishops of Alexandria, in their far-reaching aims and policy, were unwilling to allow such power or prestige to the upstart see of the queenly city, and that sometimes the bishops of old Rome might support their actions. It is not, of course, to be supposed that all the ecclesiastical dissensions of the period can be comprised in the quarrels between the great seas, although, for our present purpose, that series of conflicts seems the best to choose as our guiding line. Though the Arian heresy lived vigorously all through the century, it had become for the most part a religion of barbarians. It was not so much a source of disunion within the empire as a serious, perhaps insuperable, obstacle to a good understanding between the Roman and the Teuton. The Arianism of the Ostrogoths was at least one of the most prominent weaknesses of their kingdom in Italy, but the empire, generally speaking, was Nicene. The only regions which had not adopted, or were not soon to adopt, the definitions of the first general council lay in the far east, beyond the limits of undisputed imperial sway. When these are brought into the general current of church history, they take one side or another in the prevalent controversies with very conspicuous results. Again, the Pelagian controversy on free will and original sin will not here concern us in proportion to its theological and philosophical interests. Though its roots lay deep and ever and anon put forth new shoots, it did not result in a definite schism. Taking then the main lines of controversy as already indicated, we may distinguish four phases or periods within the fifth century. In the first we have an attack on a bishop of Constantinople, a representative of the Antiochene school, by an archbishop of Alexandria. Rome sympathizes with Constantinople, but Alexandria triumphs for a time, in general part by court influence, Chrysostom controversy. In the second, Alexandria again advances against Constantinople, the bishop of which is again Antiochene. Rome, in this phase of the conflict, sides with Alexandria, which prevails. Court influence is divided, but gradually comes over to the Alexandrian side, Nestorian controversy. In the third, Alexandria is again aggressive and prevails over Constantinople by force. Rome fails at first to obtain a hearing, but helps to get the doctrinal point settled in another council. Eutychian or Monophysite controversy. In the fourth, the controversy is caused by an abortive attempt started by an emperor but manipulated by the bishops of Constantinople and of Alexandria working together to reunite some at least of the parties alienated by the decision of the last conflict. Rome disapproves strongly, and the result is a serious blow to imperial authority in the West, Hanoticon controversy. Part 1. The chief persons then in the first controversy are Theophilus of Alexandria and Chrysostom of Constantinople. The doctrinal question is not to the front, and the interest is in the great part personal. This is, in fact, the only one of the controversies in which one side at least, here the one on defense, has an imposing leader, but perhaps it is the one in which it is least possible to find any reasons beyond motives of official ambition or of personal antipathy. The beginner of the attack, Theophilus, who held the Alexandrian Sea from 385 to 412, has earned a bad name in history for violence and duplicity. He was probably not more unscrupulous than many leading men among his contemporaries, and excelled most of them in scientific and literary tastes. But he has incurred the odium which attaches to every religious persecutor who has not the mitigating plea of personal fanaticism. 
Another excuse might be alleged in extenuation of his unjust actions, the excessively difficult position in which he was placed. The peculiar character of the government of Egypt, its close and direct connection with the imperial authority, and the absence, except in the city itself, of any civic and municipal institutions, always rendered a good understanding between bishop and prefect one of the great desiderata. The history of the sea and of its most eminent occupants had given it a prestige which was not easily kept intact without encroachments on the secular power. Alexandria had from the beginning been a city of mixed populations and cults, and at this time the factions were more numerous and the occasions of disturbance as serious as in the days of Athanasius. Arianism may have been quelled, but paganism was still vigorous, and had adherents both in the academies of the grammarians and philosophers, and also among the most ignorant of the lower classes, who even anticipated disaster when the measuring gauge was moved from the temple of Serapis to a church. The Jewish element was large, and the broad toleration of Alexander, the Ptolemies, and the pagan emperors was hardly to be expected in the stormy days which had followed the conversion of Constantine. But more difficult to deal with than prefects, town mobs, philosophers, or Jews, though a more powerful weapon to use if tactfully secured, was the vast number of monks that dwelt in the desert and other regions within the Alexandrian Sea. These did not constitute one body and were very dissimilar among themselves. The rule of those who had a rule will be set forth in the following chapter. Here we have to notice the difficulties which the soaring speculations of some, the crass ignorance of others, and the detachment of all from worldly convention and ordinary constituted authority placed in the way of any attempt to bring them within the general system of civil and ecclesiastical order. Theophilus was himself a man of learning and culture, eclectic in tastes, diplomatic in schemes. He had used his mathematical knowledge to make an elaborate table of the Easter cycle. He favored in later days the candidature of a philosophic pagan, Synesius of Cyrene, for the bishopric of Ptolemais. He could read and enjoy the works of writers whose teaching he was publicly anathematizing. He appreciated the force of monastic piety and endeavored, by vigorous and even violent means, to impose episcopal consecration on some leading ascetics. He showed his powers as pacificator in helping to compose dissension in the Church of Antioch, 392, and in that of Bostra, 394. He obtained from the civil authority powers to demolish the great temple of Serapis, which was done successfully, though not without creating much bitterness of feeling. The great campaign of his life, however, began with an attack on the followers of Oregon at the very beginning of the 5th century. There seems some paradox in the circumstance that the strife between the Alexandrian and the Antiochian should have begun, as far as our present purpose is concerned, by an attack made by an Alexandrian patriarch on the principles of the most eminent of all Alexandrian theologians. Theophilus was, both before and after the controversy, an appreciative student of Oregon. He had already aroused a tumultuous opposition from some Egyptian monks who were practically anthropomorphites by insisting on the doctrine laid down by Oregon as to the incorporeality of the divine nature, that God is invisible by reason of his nature and incomprehensible by reason of the limits of human intelligence. The line he now took up may have been due to the influence of Jerome, at that time organizing an anti-organistic crusade in Palestine, or else, in his opposition to the philosophic paganism of Alexandria, he may have become nervous of any concessions as to the aeons and gnosis and final restitution, 
Or again, as seems most probable, he saw a powerful ally in his ambition for his see in the grossest and least enlightened theology of his day, that of the unhappy monk who wept that they had taken away his god, when in the earlier stage of the controversy the doctrines of the anthropomorphites were condemned by the man who was now their champion. Having determined to combat organism, Theophilus called a synod to Alexandria which decreed against it. He followed up the ecclesiastical censure by securing from the prefect the support of the secular arm. An attack was made by night on the settlement of those monks in the district of Nitria who were supposed to be imbued with the organistic doctrine. The leaders of them were the four tall brethren, monks of considerable repute, formerly treated by Theophilus with great respect. Hounded out by soldiers and by the rival anthropomorphite monks, the tall brothers fled for their lives and after many vicissitudes arrived in Constantinople and appealed to the protection of the bishop John Chrysostom. In position and in character, Chrysostom bears a marked contrast to his opponent Theophilus. Both, it is true, were men of learning and culture. Both were exposed to the caprices of a pleasure-loving and much-divided populace. But Chrysostom had one disadvantage more. He was under the immediate eye of a court. It was by court influence, unsought on his part, that he had been elevated, and the same influence could easily be turned against him. The emperor Arcadius was of a sluggish temperament, but his wife, Eudoxia, a Frankish lady, was violent in her likes and dislikes, sensitive, ambitious, and inspired by a showy and aggressive piety. John had led the sea since 397. In early days he had studied under the pagan Libanius at Antioch, and later he had been trained in the theological school of that city. He was an intimate friend of Theodore of Mopsuestia, the most eminent leader of Antiochian thought, whose principles in the next stage of the controversy came to the front. Himself a practical teacher rather than a theological systematizer, he had devoted his power and eloquence both in Antioch and Constantinople to the restraint of violence and the denunciation of vice and frivolity. He had in earlier days followed for some years the monastic life and was always ascetic in self-discipline and tactless towards those under his authority. He had been brought into public prominence during the anxious time in 387 at Antioch after the riot. On his appointment at Constantinople, he showed great firmness in resisting the demands made upon him by the minister Eutropius and subsequently in negotiations with the Gothic general Gainus. He preached much, and his sermons were intensely popular, for the people of Byzantium, however mixed, were sufficiently Greek to enjoy good speaking. But John seems to have done more than excite a transient enthusiasm. A good many Constantinopolitans, particularly some well-born women, devoted their lives to the works he commended to them. By his clergy, as might be expected, he was both well-beloved and well-hated. Just at the time when Theophilus was beginning his attacks on the organistic monks, Chrysostom was starting on an expedition which was the beginning of all his troubles. Complaints had been brought to him of the bad conduct of the bishop of Ephesus. He sent to make inquiries, and though the accused bishop had in the meantime died, Chrysostom was requested by the clergy and people of Ephesus to come and settle their affairs. Accordingly, the first three months of the year 401 were spent by him in a visitation of Asia in the removal of many clergy and the putting down of much corruption. No doubt he considered that he was acting within his rights according to the canon of Constantinople and the precedent set by the previous bishops. But he had given a handle to the rival see of Alexandria. 
Worse than this, his absence had led to difficulties at home where Severianus, a wandering bishop whom he had left as locum tenens, and Serapion, Chrysostom's archdeacon and friend, had quarreled beyond hope of reconciliation. On his return, Chrysostom judged Severianus to be in fault, and thereby affronted the empress, who had taken delight in Severianus's sermons. With so much of combustible elements about, the arrivals from Egypt were likely to cause a general conflagration. Chrysostom received the tall brethren courteously and admitted them to some of the church services, though he hesitated to receive them into full communion till the charge of heresy hanging over them had been removed. He seems to have wished to avoid any provocative measures, but the brothers, anxious to remove the slur, or perhaps stirred up by some sinister interest, appealed to the empress as she rode down the streets in her chariot. The result was that Theophilus himself was summoned to Constantinople to stand a charge of calumny and persecution, with darker accusations in the background. He came, but, though nominally accused, he actually took the role of accuser. Before Theophilus himself arrived in Constantinople, he showed the measure of respect in which he held that see by inducing his friend Epiphanius, bishop of Constantia in Cyprus, to go thither on the business of Oregon. Epiphanius had a reputation for piety and zeal, but seems to have traded on that reputation and on his advanced years in going beyond all bounds of courtesy and even of legality. He came with a large following of bishops and clergy, began his mission by the ordination of a deacon, an act of defiance to Chrysostom's authority, refused the hospitality offered by the bishop, and endeavored by colloquies with the clergy and harangues to the people to obtain the condemnation of organ which Chrysostom refused to pronounce. He returned baffled, but soon after Theophilus himself appeared at Constantinople and speedily gathered a party among those who had, from any reason, a grudge against Chrysostom. Strange to say, the organistic question retired into the background. Some of the bishops and clergy at Constantinople were greatly attached to the writings of Organ, with which, as we have seen, Theophilus had a secret intellectual sympathy. The charge of Organism was brought against some of John's adherents. The charges preferred against himself were either trivial or very improbable. If any of them were founded on fact, the utmost we can safely gather from them is that John may have erred occasionally by severity in discipline, and that his ascetic habits and delicate digestion had proved incompatible with generous hospitality. It is hardly necessary to say that Theophilus was acting without a shadow of right, he had thirty-six bishops with him, and many more were coming from Asia at the emperor's bidding. Chrysostom had forty who kept by his side. The strange phenomenon of a dual synod will be met again in the next conflict. Theophilus had the support of the court, but he did not venture to pass judgment within the precincts of the capital. A synod was held in the neighborhood of Chalcedon, on the Asiatic side of the Bosporus. Theophilus was present and presided, unless the presidency was held by the old rival see of Heraclea. John refused four times to appear, and a judgment was passed against him. As to the tall brethren, two had died, and the other two made no opposition. A tumultuous scene followed in Constantinople, but John, rather than become a cause of bloodshed, withdrew under protest. But he did not go far from the city, and in three days he was summoned back. Constantinople suffered at this time from a shock of earthquake, which seems to have alarmed the empress, and the dislike of Egyptian interference stimulated the desire of the people of Constantinople to recover their bishop. 
Arcadius sent a messenger to summon John home. John at first prudently declined to come without the resolution of a synod, but his scruples were overcome and he was reinstated in triumph. But his return of good fortune was not of long duration. What the court had lightly given, it might lightly withdraw. The new cause of offence was a remonstrance made by Chrysostom, who objected to the noise and revelings consequent on the erection of a statue of the empress close to the church where he officiated. Eudoxia's blood was up. Report said that the bishop had compared her to Herodias. He had possibly compared his duty to that of John the Baptist, and his hearers had pressed the analogy further. He had previously made a quite pertinent comparison of her court clergy to the priests of Baal, who did eat at Jezebel's table, and the inference had seemed to be that the empress was a Jezebel. A synod was hastily convoked. Theophilus did not appear this time, but John's opponents were now sufficient. He was accused of violating a canon of the Council of Antioch, 341, in having returned without waiting for a synodical decree. Insult was here added to injury. The canon had been passed by an Arian council. The violation of it had been due to imperial pressure. But there was no way of escape. Amid scenes of confusion and bloodshed, John was conveyed to Caucasus on the Armenian frontier and afterwards to Pityus in Pontus. His steadfastness under persecution, the letters by which he sought to strengthen the hands of his friends and disciples, and the efforts of his adherents, besides producing a great moral effect, seemed likely to bring about a reversal of the sentence. Pope Innocent I wrote a letter of sympathy to Chrysostom and one of strong remonstrance to Theophilus, to whom a formal deputation was sent. To the clergy and people of Constantinople, he wrote a vigorous protest against the legality of what had been done and asserted the need of a council of East and West but for such a council he could only wait the opportunity in faith and patience. He did all he could by laying the matter before the Emperor Honorius at Ravenna. A deputation of clergy was sent from Emperor and Pope to Constantinople. On the way, however, the messengers had their dispatches stolen from them, and they only returned from their bootless errand after many dangers and insults. Meantime, the fire was allowed to burn itself out. The sufferings of Chrysostom were ended by his death in exile in September 407. There were still adherents of his in Constantinople who refused to recognize his successor, as did also many bishops in the West. The breach was healed when Atticus, second bishop after Chrysostom, restored the name of his great predecessor to the diptychs, or tablets, on which the names of lawful bishops were inscribed. It can hardly be said that this part of the controversy was ecclesiastical in the strict sense of the word. It made no new departure in church doctrines and disciplines, but it revealed the more or less hidden forces by which succeeding conflicts were to be decided. End of section 58 Section 59 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 2. In the second period, the Alexandrian leader was Cyril, nephew of Theophilus, who had succeeded him as bishop in 412. The Byzantine bishop was Nestorius, who succeeded Sicinius in 428. Both of these prelates were more distinctly theological controversialists than were the chiefs in the last encounter. But theology apart, they succeeded to all the difficulties in church and state that had beset their predecessors, and neither of them was gifted with forbearance and tact. 
Cyril's episcopate began with violent conflicts between Christians and Jews, in which the ecclesiastical power came into collision with the civil. The story is well known how the bishop canonized a turbulent monk who had met his end in the anti-Jewish brawls, how the prefect, Orestes, opposed him in this and other high-handed acts and fell a victim to the Alexandrian mob. The murder of Hypatia in 415 is not perhaps to be laid directly to Cyril's charge, but it illustrates the attitude of anti-pagan fanaticism towards the noblest representatives of Hellenic culture. Perhaps we may see here the effects of the policy of Theophilus when he stirred up the more ignorant of the monks to chase away or to destroy those more capable of philosophic views. The monks were indeed becoming a more and more uncontrollable element in the situation. Cyril allied himself with a very powerful person, the Archimandrite Senuti, who plays a large part in the history of Egyptian monasticism and also in the Monophysite schism. At present he was orthodox, or rather his views were those that had not yet been differentiated from orthodoxy, and his zeal was shown chiefly in organizing raids on idols, temples, and pagan priests, and in attacks, less reprehensible perhaps, but no more respectful of private property, on the goods of wealthy landowners who defrauded and oppressed the poor. Nestorius came from Isauria. His education had been in Antioch, and the doctrines with which his name is associated are those of the great Antiochene school carried to their logical and practical conclusions. But this association has a pathetic and almost a grotesque interest. Much labor has of recent years been devoted to the task of ascertaining what Nestorius actually preached and wrote, and the result may be to acquit him of many of the extravagances imputed to him by his opponents. To put the case rather crudely, experts have contended that Nestorius was not a Nestorian. He seems to have been a harsh and unpleasant man, though capable of acquiring friends, intolerant of doctrinal eccentricities other than his own. He made it his mission to prevent men from assigning the attributes of humanity to the deity, and boldly took the consequences of his position. Like Chrysostom, he suffered from the proximity and active ecclesiastical interest of the imperial family. When Nestorius became bishop of Constantinople in 428, the emperor Theodosius II was in the 27th year of his age and the 20th of his reign. Though his character and abilities offer in some respects a favorable comparison with those of his father, he suffered, partly through his education, from a too narrowly theological outlook on his empire and its duties. For fourteen years a leading part in all matters, especially ecclesiastical, had been taken by his elder sister, Pocheria, who had superintended his education and seems to have maintained a jealous regard for her own influence. The influence was at times more or less thwarted by her sister-in-law, Eudokia, the clever Athenian lady whom she had herself induced Theodosius to take in marriage. Nestorius had somehow incurred the enmity of Pulcheria. The cause is too deeply buried in the dirt of court scandal to be disinterred. Eudokia, though she is often in opposition to her sister-in-law, does not seem to have had any leanings to the party of Nestorius, and in the end, as we shall see, she took a much stronger line against it than did Pulcheria. But both ladies, in addition to personal feelings, had decided theological leanings, and to these the Alexandrians were able to appeal. The theological principles of Cyril were those of the Alexandrian school. To him it seemed that the doctrine of the incarnation of the Logos is impugned by any hesitation to assign the attributes of humanity to the divine Christ. It was this theological principle which was the cause, or at least the pretext, of his first attack on Nestorius. The distinctions between the Alexandrian and Antiochene schools have their roots far back in the history of theological ideas, 
One of the main differences lies in the preference by the Alexandrians for allegorical modes of interpreting scripture, while the Antiochenes preferred, in the first instance at least, a more literal method. This is not unnatural so far as Alexandria is concerned. That city had seen the first attempt at amalgamation of Jewish and Hellenic conceptions by the solvent force of figure and symbolism, while underneath there worked the mind of primeval Egypt. The speculations of Philo and his successors, both Christian and pagan, carried on the tradition into Orthodox theology. The Christology of Alexandria had produced the Homo Usios, and now it regarded that term as needing further development, as pointing to an entire union, henosis, of divine and human in the nature of Christ, beyond any conjunction, sunaphea, which seemed to admit a possible duality. On the other side, the Antiochene school is well represented by Theodore of Mopsuestia, the friend of Chrysostom, and the teacher, whether directly or indirectly, of Nestorius. He was a learned man and a great commentator, who insisted on the need of historical and literary studies in elucidating Holy Scripture. His eminence in this respect is to be seen in the fact that we often find him cited in quite recent commentaries. In his Christology he held that the union of the divine and the human in the person of Jesus was moral rather than physical or dynamical, katudokian rather than katusian or katanergeian. He was, however, very careful to avoid the deduction that the relation of divine and human was similar in kind, though different in degree, in Christ and in his followers. The actions and qualities ascribed to Christ as man, and particularly his birth, sufferings, and death, were not to be attributed to the deity without some qualifying phrase. This question might have seemed to be one of purely academic interest, if it had not obtained an excellent catchword which appealed to the popular mind, the title of Theotokos, Mother of God as applied to the Virgin Mary, vehemently asserted by the Alexandrians, rejected or accepted with many qualifications by the Antiochenes. The fierceness of the battle over this word suggests analogies and associations which are easily exaggerated. In some sermons preached on behalf of the Alexandrian view, there are remarks which seem to foreshadow the virgin cult in medieval and modern times, and the great glory of Cyril, as we find in superscriptions of his works, was that of being the chief advocate of the Theotokos. Again, and this is a more important point, and one that will meet us again, both the word and the conception could be interpreted in harmony with one of the strongest elements in revived paganism. The worship of a maternal deity, such as seems to have prevailed widely in the earliest civilizations of Mediterranean lands, had again come to the fore in the last conflict of paganism with Christianity. The mysteries of Isis and of Kibele were widespread. Julian wrote a mystic treatise in honor of the mother of the gods, and as he blames the Christians for applying the term mother of God to the Virgin Mary, he seems here to be following his ordinary policy of strengthening Hellenism on its devotional side by bringing in such elements from Christianity as might be found compatible with it. The reverse process, by which Christianity among both the educated and the uneducated was assimilating pagan ideas, was of course going on at the same time, consciously in some quarters, unconsciously in others. But it would be a mistake to look on the Nestorian controversy as chiefly, or even as greatly, connected with the honor of the Virgin. Nestorius himself, in one of his sayings, probably uttered in a testy mood, protested, anyhow, don't make the virgin a goddess. But this is, I believe, almost the only utterance of the kind during the controversy. Generally speaking, on its speculative side, the controversy was Christological, 
The Nicene Fathers had finally pronounced on the relation of the Father to the Divine Logos, but within the limits of orthodoxy there was room for a difference as to the relation of the Logos to the human Christ. Some, on the Antiochene side, dreaded lest the idea of the humanity should be entirely merged in that of the Logos. Others, leaning towards Alexandria, would avoid any contamination of the Logos by the associations of humanity. Meantime, the unphilosophical minds that took part in the dispute imagined in a vague way that it was possible for human beings to commit the crime of literally confusing the nature of the deity or of cutting Christ in pieces. The position of Nestorius himself and of those who followed him most closely is summarized in a saying of his that was often quoted and oftener misquoted. I cannot speak of God as being two or three months old. He regarded it as impiety to attribute to a person of the Trinity the acts and accidents of human, still more, of infant life. The Alexandrians, on the other hand, considered this view as virtually implying the existence of two Christs, a divine and a human, Naturally, the opponents made no efforts to understand one another's position, and if they had, their efforts could hardly have been successful. During this unhappy century, the mind of man had gone hopelessly astray as to its limitations. Intellectual courage had survived intellectual contact with facts, but that courage was often directed against chimeras. The Pope of Rome at this juncture was Celestine I, 422-432. He seems to have been a conscientious and active ruler, a strict disciplinarian, yet averse to extreme rigor in dealing with delinquents. As we have already said, in this conflict Rome is not on the side of Constantinople and Antioch, but on that of Alexandria. Among the many reasons that may be assigned for the change, two considerations are prominent. First, that the relations between the seas of Rome and of Constantinople had been somewhat strained through rival claims to ecclesiastical supremacy in the regions of Illyria, and, secondly, that Celestine was a devoted admirer of Augustine and anxious to put down the Pelagian heresy. Nestorius, we may safely say, was not himself a Pelagian. In some, at least, of his extant discourses he strongly opposes that teaching. But it is clear that the most eminent Antiochene theologians were not so pronounced as was Augustine in their doctrine of original sin and of predestination. Theodore of Mopsuestia was accused of the same tendency, though he avoided the heretical deductions from his principles, and Nestorius himself once wrote a sympathetic letter, though the obscurity of the text makes it doubtful as evidence, to Caelestius, the notable follower of Pelagius. Again, a few years before our present date, at the Council of Carthage, 426, a monk named Leporius of Marseilles, who had been called a Nestorian before Nestorius, was condemned as a Pelagian. The Antiochene See was more definitely than it had previously been on the side of Constantinople. It was now occupied by a certain John, who plays an ambiguous part, but seems to have been favorable to Nestorius. But the most eminent person on this side was Theodoret, bishop of Cyrus in the province of Euphratensis, a learned theologian, a good fighter, and a man of generous impulses, though he did not keep by his friend Nestorius to the bitter end. In these eastern bishops we see a growing jealousy of the overweening power of Alexandria. The Church of Edessa, which had, generally speaking, lived a life apart, was drawn into the controversy. The bishop Robulus, though not inclined to urge the adoption of the disputed terms, took the anti-Nestorian side. His successor, however, Ibas, 435, upheld the Nestorian position and retained for centuries the reverence of the Nestorian Christians of the East. 
To take up briefly the main events of the controversy, it was most probably during the Christmas festival of the year 428, or else early in 429, that Proclus, bishop of Cyzicus, but resident at Constantinople, preached a sermon in which he used and expounded the term Theotokos. Nestorius replied to this discourse by another in which he warned the people to distinguish between the divine word and the temple in which the deity dwelt, and to avoid saying without qualifications that God was born of Mary. Nestorius seems to have been more guarded in his language than some of his clergy, especially a priest called Anastasius, who condemned the word Theotokos altogether, and even denounced as heretics those who used it. It is extremely difficult to determine how widely the Antiochene or Nestorian view prevailed, and whether it had yet reached Egypt, and on this question depends the conviction or acquittal of Cyril in regard to the charge of aggressive violence generally brought against him. In the Easter of 429, he issued an encyclical to the Egyptian monks, warning them against the dangers ahead. Men were teaching doctrines, he said, which would bring Christ down to the level of ordinary humanity. Soon after, he wrote a long letter to the emperor, image of God on earth, against heresies in general and the new one, with which, however, he does not couple the name of Nestorius in particular. He followed this up by two very long treatises to the most pious princesses, Pocheria and her sisters, in which he cites many fathers to justify the term Theotokos, and makes out that the new heretics would assert two Christs. The appeal to the ladies does not seem to have pleased Theodosius, who resented Cyril's use of the discord in the imperial family. Cyril, when once he had begun, spared no pains to succeed. He had agents in Constantinople and adherents whom, at much trouble and expense, he had attached to his cause. Especially he had the support of a large following among the monks. We have his letters, written both to Nestorius himself and to Celestine, Bishop of Rome. In all of them he takes the ground of one having authority, of one also who, in spite of personal affection for Nestorius as a man, is bound to consider the supreme interests of the truth. Nestorius in turn eulogizes Christian Epiakia, a grace in which he does not himself seem to have excelled, but maintains an independent bearing. He somewhat superfluously accuses Cyril of ignorance of the Nicene Creed, and reassures him as to the satisfactory state of the church in Constantinople. Nestorius was meantime in correspondence with Celestine on another matter. Certain bishops from the West, accused of heresy, had come to Constantinople. How was he to deal with them? He had to write a second time before a rather curt answer came that of course they were heretics, and so was Nestorius himself. They are known from other sources to have been Pelagians. Cyril had by this time sent to Rome a Latin translation of the communications that had passed between him and Nestorius with regard to the whole Christological question. A synod was consequently held at Rome, which approved of Cyril's actions and position, and the Pope wrote to the clergy of Constantinople, as well as to Cyril and to Nestorius himself. Ten days were given to Nestorius to make a satisfactory explanation, after which he and those holding with him were to be held excommunicated. Letters announcing this decision were sent to the bishops of Antioch, Jerusalem, Thessalonica, and Philippi. To Cyril the Pope delegated the power to take necessary action against Nestorius and his followers. In a synod held at Alexandria, a series of propositions condemnatory of the doctrine taught by Nestorius and insisting on that of the physical union, Henusus Fusake, were drawn up. In consequence of these actions, Nestorius, urged by John of Antioch, Theodorus of Cyrus, and others, made certain explanations so as to tolerate the figurative use of the word Theotokos. Footnote 1. 
id est, in accordance with the union of the two natures in Christ, even during mortal life. End of footnote. But he stood his ground as to the main principles, and issued, with the support of his adherents, a list of counter-anathemas to those of Cyril. It may seem strange that local councils and leading bishops or patriarchs should have gone so far without insisting on a general council. One person evidently took this view, the emperor Theodosius himself. The builder of the Theodosian Wall and the promulgator of the Theodosian Code can hardly have been the mere weakling that some historians would paint him. He seems to have been a man of some energy and love of fair play, though he had not the strength to carry out a policy to the end. Now, however, jointly with his cousin Valentinian, he issued a writ summoning eastern and western bishops to a council to be held the following Whitsuntide, 431, at Ephesus. He did not attempt to go himself, but he sent as his emissary the Count Candidianus to keep order by military force if necessary, and especially to prevent monks and laymen from intruding. Pope Celestine sent two deputies instructed to act along with Cyril. Cyril himself went largely accompanied. Among his monastic followers was the wild ascetic Sanuti of Panopolis already mentioned, though the stories of Sanuti's conduct at the council are not easily brought into accordance with the facts we have. Nestorius and his Constantinopolitan friends went there, but kept at a prudent distance from the Egyptians. John of Antioch and forty Asiatic bishops came likewise, but at slow pace. Their delay, whether accidental or designed, determined the character and events of the council. The weak point about the Council of Ephesus was that the presiding judge and the principal prosecutor were one and the same person, in an assembly which, though supposed to be primarily legislative, had also to exercise judicial functions. From the very first, Nestorius had no chance, and he declined to recognize the authority of the council till all its members were assembled. Cyril was in no mind to allow this plea, and, perhaps, in refusing to wait for the eastern bishops, he overreached himself and brought subsequent trouble on his own head. Celestine's delegates had not arrived, but there was no reason to wait for them, as it was known they had been instructed to follow the Alexandrian lead. John of Antioch and the other eastern bishops were, of course, an essential part of the council, but a message of excuse which John had sent was tacitly construed into acquiescence with what might be done before his arrival. Accordingly, in spite of remonstrances from Nestorius, from a good many eastern bishops who had already arrived, and from the imperial commissioners, the council was opened sixteen days after the appointed time, without the Antiochenes or those who were in favor of any kind of compromise with Nestorius. Messengers were sent to Nestorius, who refused to attend. It was the work of one day, the first session of the council, to condemn him and deprive him of his see. This was done on the testimony of his letters, his reported speeches, and his rejection of the messengers from the council. One hundred and ninety-eight bishops signed these decrees. The populace of Ephesus received the result with wild enthusiasm and gave the champions of the Theotokes an ovation on their way to their lodgings. Perhaps it is not mere fanciful analogy to recall the two hours shouting of an earlier city mob, Great Artemis of the Ephesians. Five days afterwards, John of Antioch arrived. He had with him comparatively few bishops, and when he was joined by the Nestorians, the number of his party only amounted to forty-three. There seems a touch of irony in the assertion which he made afterwards that the reason of his scanty numbers was to be found in his strict injunctions to follow out the emperor's directions, 
Similarly, when he justifies the delay by the necessity that the bishops should officiate in their churches on the first Sunday after Easter, we may seem to have a covert hit at Cyril's large numbers who found no difficulty in absenting themselves from their flocks. From the first, John took his stance against the acts of Cyril. He rejected the communications of the council and joined forces with Nestorius. The imperial officials afforded him protection and support. In the conciliabulum, as his assembly was contemptuously called, Cyril and Memnon of Ephesus were in their turn deprived and excommunicated. Meantime, the original council, now joined by delegates from Rome, continued its sessions, deposed John and all his adherents, and continued to pass decrees against the Pelagians and other heretics. Whether or no the precise articles anathematizing Nestorius, which had been drawn up at Alexandria, were passed by the council is a disputed matter and one of inferior importance. Their sense was certainly maintained, and they were answered by counter-anathematisms on the other side. The situation was becoming intolerable. Two rival assemblies of bitterly hostile factions were sitting in conclave through the sultry days of an eastern summer in a city always given to turbulence and now stirred up by long and eloquent discourses such as a Greek populace ever loved to hear. Count Candidianus and the other imperial delegates had a hard task. He had, after the first session, torn down the placards declaring the deposition of Nestorius. He tried to prevent the Egyptian party from preaching inflammatory sermons and from communicating the fever of controversy to Constantinople. This, however, he could not do, as Cyril found means of corresponding with the monks of Constantinople. The emperor himself was hardly equal to the emergency. The difficulty as to Nestorius was partly removed by the offer of Nestorius himself to retire to a monastery. With regard to the other leaders, Cyril and Memnon were for a time imprisoned. The emperor received embassies from both sides and finally decided to maintain the decisions of both councils. Maximian, a priest of Constantinople, was appointed to the vacant see of that city. Then Cyril and Memnon were liberated and restored to their sees, and the remaining members of the council were bidden to return home unless they could first find some means of accommodation with the Orientals. The means by which the emperor's partial change of front and the yet more clearly marked prevalence of anti-Nestorian feeling at court were brought about can only be brought to light by untangling a most involved skein of ecclesiastical diplomacy. From a letter of one of Cyril's agents, as well as from the recently published account of Nestorius himself, there was a profuse distribution of gratitudes among notable persons, including the princesses themselves. But Cyril appealed to zeal as well as to avarice. It would appear that a good many people in Constantinople were favorable to Nestorius, but that the clergy and the monks were generally against him. The union between Egyptians and Orientals was brought to pass sooner than we might have expected. It was based on an explanation not wholly unlike that urged on Nestorius by John of Antioch near the beginning of the difficulties, an acknowledgment of two natures united into one, duo fuseon henusus, and mientin to theo fusen cesarcomenin, with a recognition in virtue of the union of the propriety of the term theotokos. It was a triumph for Cyril, but some of the most independent of his opponents still held out, especially Theodoret, the best theologian of the party and the most faithful, a slight distinction to his friends, refused to be included in an arrangement which did not restore all the sees of the dispossessed bishops to their rightful occupants. 
it was only to a special decree of the emperor enforcing ecclesiastical agreement in the East that he gave at last a qualified assent. But the indignant protest widely raised against Alexandrian ambition was expressed in a playful letter which he wrote after Cyril's death in 444, in which, along with more charitable wishes that we might expect for the final judgment on his soul, he recommends that a large stone be placed over the grave to keep quiet the disturber who had now gone to propagate strange doctrines among the shades below. The last efforts of Cyril had been towards the condemnation of the great commentator, the father of Antiochian philosophy, Theodore of Mopsuestia. The reverence in which the memory of Theodore was held caused the scheme to fail, only to be renewed with baneful consequences by the Emperor Justinian. End of section 59